Bring on. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the April Electric Railroaders Association uh, Zoom meeting. Um, tonight's presentation will be recorded. I want to make just a few brief announcements before um, we start. Uh, we have a full set of activities now that we're finally past the pandemic. Um, the signature event is our Electric Railroaders Association Convention, uh, which will be in two cities. It will be in Portland and Seattle. All the details are on erausa.org. That's erausa.org. You can register and pay online or print out the the PDF and send the check in, but it's very fast if you do it online. Uh, Treasurer Mike Glicken just informed me that there are 38 spots registered. We have 12 and only 12 spots available. Once those 12 spots go, we are sold out and we did sell out last year. So if you are interested in going, you are going to want to uh, register register sooner rather than later. So that's number one. The, we do also, for the first time in a few years, uh, we are resuming local tours in the New York, New Jersey region. And our first tour is of the Staten Island Railway Clifton Shops. Um, that location has been a Staten Island Railway shop for many years, but due to uh, hurricane damage, a basically a brand new shop was built in its place. Um, we can have 40 people on that tour, and we are currently, I have about 20 registrations. Again, those tours also sell out, so if you think you would like to go, um, the requirements are on the um, on the on the website. Unfortunately, that one you're going to have to send in uh, check, picture ID, and waivers. This is after all the New York MTA we're dealing with, and there many transit agencies are very security conscious. But we still have 20 spots. If you're interested in coming, thirty-five dollars. Please uh, please register today. All right, this third event has not yet been announced. It will be announced soon. Um, it will not be placed on the website, but it will be sent to all paid up members in good standing. We are very slowly reintroducing in-person meetings. We will have an in-person meeting on Friday, July 28th. I believe the time is seven o'clock, but anyone who's a paid up member We'll get a direct link invitation to that uh, meeting, and that meeting does include uh, include dinner. It will be at Mandukatis, which is a, a restaurant one stop out of Grand Central. It's in Long Island City. So those are all of my announcements. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker, and the way we do it since. Uh, a speaker will give their presentation. If you have questions during the presentation, uh, please put them in the chat. I will look at an appropriate time to break in and ask uh, Rich the questions. Um, and let me introduce him right now. He was not our originally scheduled speaker. I was going to have him later in the year, but we had to move him up because our speaker for today who originally scheduled was um, Clark Frazier. His laptop was uh, stolen. He did get it back, but it was too late. Uh, it, it was too late to um, for us to do any discussion. He was a new speaker. We will get him later this year. We're very fortunate to have Rich Krisak back. He last spoke to us August 2021. He is a retired. Chief Operating Officer of the Atlanta uh, Rapid Transit Authority. He is an Ohio native. His original presentation in October was on Cleveland Transit 19, uh, up to 1955. Today, he's gonna take us on 
a trip called Cleveland Transit 1955 to 1975, Mobility Redefined. So as I said, that is a continuation. Um, this, pre this presentation covers uh, a really tumultuous period, uh, including the discussions of, well, the opening of the rapid transit, the rapid transit line. Oh boy, give me one second here. I lost everybody here for a minute here. Shoot. One second. Oh boy, what is this? Hello, everybody here? I hear you. Yeah, okay, we hear hold on. you. All right, I've, I've, I've just lost the, the video to see you all. So give me one second. We can see and hear you. You can right see now. and hear me. Okay. Yes. Yep. So I don't want to log off. What I, let me see if I can. This has never happened to me before here. Oh boy, uh, it's been launched. Don't see, but you agree to yes. Okay. Oh, okay. I see what happened. Never mind. Sorry for that. The little technical glitch. Totally my fault. So anyway, um, basically, what you're going to see are a lot of photos during that period, 55 to 75, including a revitalized network, which included new trolley buses and motor coaches, as well as uh, Shaker Heights. But at the time, Cleveland was the seventh largest city in the US and a lot, a lot of Midwest cities did go through a death spiral. I think it's on its way back, but Rich's shows are always very comprehensive treatment of Cleveland transit, uh, is excellent uh, presentation. And with no further ado, uh, Rich, you can go ahead, start and share your screen. There we go. Yeah, we're good. Okay. okay. Take it away. So this, uh, I'm just, just to start off with this title slide, because uh, a couple of folks have asked, this is uh, actually a, a rendering that was done for Pullman Standard. It was part of a Pullman Standard advertisement that, were, that was in uh, trade journals uh, at the opening of the uh, airport rapid transit extension. So they, they were very proud of these cars, and, uh, promoted them heavily. So um, again, the title is, you know, we were covering 1955 to 75, and, and I say mobility defined, and you'll find out why mobility was defined as we step through the presentation. So, it's a lot to cover in this 20 year period. And I try to hit the highlights. I'm sure I missed some things that that uh, some folks may have thought I should have included, but I think uh, I tried to do the best I could. I did uh, photo credits uh, where I could as appropriate, where I knew uh, who actually took the photo. Uh, some of the stuff I bought off of eBay and you know, a lot of the stuff you buy off of eBay is not identified. If it is, I identified it. Uh, but uh, thanks to all the photographers who stood out there and took all these fantastic uh, pictures. Um, so one thing I, I wanted to mention, because I've been watching a lot of, of information about AI technology and how it's shaping our future. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that this presentation is all human content and there's no AI involved. So just so everybody knows. So to kind of like recap where we are, 1954 was the end of streetcar service in Cleveland. Uh, the last cars ran on Madison Avenue. There was a promotion by the Cleveland Press, which is now gone, one of uh, Cleveland's three newspapers at the time. 
they went from Public Square over to uh, West 65th Street and Bridge back and forth. They carried so many people uh, that they wound up having to drag out a bunch of cars, uh, much more than they thought they would need uh, for the uh, for the trip. By this time, the PCC cars were already off the property. They had been sold and they had gone to Toronto in 1953. So the cars that ended service were some of actually the older cars, uh, the 4,000s that were built around uh, in the 20s, uh, early 30s. So during this period, uh, after streetcar service was gone, the rapid transit started, CTS kind of settled into this period, kind of represented by this route map where they had surface transportation provided by a pretty modern fleet of buses and a very modern fleet of trackless trolleys, a big trackless trolley system will kind of go into that. And of course, the rapid transit. So this diagram here kind of gives you some idea of the uh, original uh, rapid transit line. Uh, the first rapid transit line in Cleveland opened in two phases. So the, the east side opened first, so station number one over here to Union Terminal here, station number eight. That opened, excuse me, in March of 1955. And then following shortly after that, uh, the west side uh, rapid extension opened up. And that went from station eight over here to station 12 at West 117th Street. The, um, the line was built by a reconstruction finance uh, loan of about $30 million. Um, one of the, um, the uh, changes that the RFC wanted uh, CTS to make in order to receive the money was to increase the board from the transit board because they had independent transit board from three members to five members. And they also wanted city council to have less interference in the direct day-to-day -day decisions that were being made by the board. I think there was some feeling that there was some previous kind of interference, particularly since the, the uh, Reed and McCarter plan was already adopted and approved by the board, which would have been a, uh, a large streetcar subway. Uh, basically, when city council got a hold of it, uh, they got their own consultant um, uh, from uh, Chicago, and they basically revamped the plan and turned it into this heavy rail plan. So there was some, you know, thought that maybe the transit board wasn't as, as independent as it should have been. So they gave us uh, 13.6 miles of rapid transit. Um, a lot of this kind of followed the Van Swergen plan particularly the, the east side rapid was a Van Swearingen product, that project that right away was already there. Uh, to utilize parts of the west side rapid transit were also part of the Van Swearingen plan. Uh, that right away was already there as part of uh, the nickel plate, uh, big grade separation project. So that right away also existed. Um, one of the surprising things when they, when they open up to 117th over here, they weren't anticipating uh, the ridership to be as big as it turned out to be. They built uh, Windermere Station as a huge terminal. I mean, it was a big facility, a lot of bus bays, a lot of parking. Um, it wasn't anticipated that West 117th would be the same way, but it turned out that the ridership at 117th actually exceeded the ridership at Windermere. And we'll talk about that as we go through this, the presentation. There's a good reason for that. So as soon as they open up the station, they wind up having to put an escalator in because they were on the stairs. They wind up having to increase parking. But we'll kind of talk about that as we go along. And then the next expansion uh, before we went go on to the airport was this expansion here um, from West 117th over to West Park Station. Uh, Cleveland at the time was run by a a very creative uh, CEO. We'll talk about him as we go further on the presentation. His name was Don Hyde. And he was very creative in running the system and very creative in financing the system. And so all this, all the work that was here done so far with the rapid transit was with the uh, RFC loan and also with additional funds that CTS was able to kind of cobble together 
Uh, so there was, of course, back at the time, there were no sales tax, there was no regional transit authority. So they were very proud that, you know, the riders of the system were paying off uh, the bonds because the bonds were pledged against ridership revenue. And they were very proud of that. But I think they knew in the long run that wasn't going to happen. So the extension, the point of that is this extension uh, from 117th to West Park was actually paid uh, by the sale of the old uh, shop, streetcar shop uh, in Cleveland, and th those proceeds were used to build the extension. So they were pretty creative in what they were trying to accomplish here. So this is uh, uh, just some promotional material for the opening of the, the, the East Side Rapid, March 1955. I would even mention, sir, that DJs will spin tunes. That's kind of interesting. Uh, so here we see a train departing Windermere Station. These are the St. Louis, they were called Bluebird cars. These are very similar to a set of cars that were built for Boston, although the Boston cars were much narrower than this um, because CTS Rapid was operating on basically a railroad uh, right of way. These cars are almost 10 and a half feet long. They're short because they were intended to operate in the subway. If we go back to this slide, the $36 million county subway, which a, um, a bond referendum was passed actually before 1953, before the rapid ever opened and the citizens committed to paying for this little dash loop here downtown, which was the subway. So these cars were basically built to run in, in a subway with very tight curves, tight restrictions. So here we see a car in 1956 leaving Windermere. It ran in the joint area. This is approaching uh, East 34th Street which was a shaker stop at this time, but not a CTS rapid stop. And up on top of the hill here, we see uh, a warehousing through terminal, New York Central had uh, facilities up here. And so did uh, the nickel plate. So we're, see, we're actually running in the joint area where they share, share trackage with the uh, shaker lights rapid transit. Here we see uh, a train uh, coming out of the terminal of course, this section uh, from the terminal to East 55th Street was kind of famous because there was left-hand running uh, because there was a couple of center platforms and the shaker cars only had doors on one side, typical streetcar. The Pullmans did have a door on the left side for a future subway, uh, but they, uh, they blocked that off and, uh, and used all the seating available in the car. So then we get to the uh, West Side Rapid Transit. There's a free ride ticket for the West Side Rapid Transit Extension. And now we've completed the uh, original 13.6 miles. This is a picture of a train coming across the COT, CUT viaduct, Cleveland Union Terminal Viaduct, which was shared by the big electric locomotives. Um, and this right of way uh, was designed to accommodate uh, West Side Rapid Transit Extension in the Van Swergen plan as were all those tunnels you saw in the previous picture here. Uh, all these tunnels you see here were built as part of the uh, interurban concourse of Cleveland Union Terminal. So the Van Swergen's thought was that the interurbans that were running at the time, of course, this, is, this was 1929, 1930, when the terminal opened up, uh, you still had Lakeshore Electric in Northern Ohio, uh, a number of interurbans that were still running. So they were supposed to uh, uh, be in the, uh, Interurban concourse, as well, of course, as the Van Swergen East Side Rapid Transit and West Side Rapid Transit. So it just shows that Vans, the Vans had just a lot of forethought in transportation planning and development in Cleveland. And they're, they're, they can still be felt, their fingerprints are still over uh, a lot of development that occurred in, in Cleveland. These guys are really sharp. So here's a nice picture by Bill Vigers coming across the viaduct. Here we are coming uh, towards uh, West 117th Station. This is an express train going to West 117th, first stop at West Park. It's at about West 97th Street. And kind of typical for the for CTS Rapid along the nickel plate right away, they were really insistent that these freight railroad sidings you see here to the right uh, would be great separated. They would not permit the CTS Rapid to have any at grade crossings. You know, if, if you think about light rail today, San Diego, you know, um, 
Baltimore, a lot of these systems have um, at grade crossings with freight railroads and they have time separation. Back then, that was not even part of the thought process. Rich, there were two questions. One from Carl Jackson, did the rapid line have regular block signaling or something else? And the second question is my question. You talk about the express. Well, this was on the west side and it went nonstop from Union Terminal to one, West 117? Yes. Yeah, they, they uh, as they got going, because the ridership was so heavy and, and they, had, so they had very good service planning people and scheduling people like Bob Cora to do their business. And so they had these series of turnback services. And as actually, as the rapid transit was extended even further towards the airport, they kept turnback service in place, uh, for instance, at period of station. So they leveraged all the assets they had and they knew their ridership very well. And so they really tailored their service that they, they really leveraged a, a small facility with a very, you know, very intense operation. Um, yeah, so they had automatic block signals uh, it started at the joint area where, where uh, Shaker and CTS came together. Uh, they had automatic block signals. The PCC cars had trip stops. I'm not sure I know of any of those uh, PCC cars that are actually equipped with trip stops, but they had trip stops. They had they had time signals, just like uh, say in the New York old, old subway system, signal system, they had time signals, they had grade signals. You know, they, they um, basically bought everything out of the GRS signal book. Uh, so they ran a very, you know, they ran, they were able to, you know, run 90 second uh, headway. Uh, so it was, it was an intense frequency operation. One, one question that came up uh, previously when I gave this to Pennsylvania Trial Museum a couple of days ago was, why was it uh, catenary? Why was it overhead? I had always thought the primary reason, it may have been the primary reason, was because obviously Shaker was overhead but they could have run overhead just in the joint area and then gone to third rail uh, outside the joint area, which apparently was their original thought process. But when they were constructing this, when they were purchasing the right away from the nickel plate and from New York Central, uh, they did not want to have third rail operations because they had a lot of freight industrial at the time. You know, there was a lot of LCL freight work going on with the railroads and there were sightings to industries across the entire length of the system. And these industries were, were very dependent on, uh, on uh, railroad service. So they didn't want, you know, uh, railroad personnel, switchmen and uh, conductors and uh, railroad employees to get to come, in, to come in contact with third rail. It was a big issue with the railroad. So they decided to go catenary the entire month. So that's the answer for that question. You learn, you learn something new every day. So we talked about, you know, why was West 117 such a heavily used uh, station? And if you look at the rapid transit plans, um, previous rapid transit plans of the Van Swergens, the West Side Rapid was intended to go straight down the Nickel Plate Railroad here into Lakewood and then further into Rocky River. Um, if you look at the old subway studies and rapid transit studies, Lakewood was just a phenomenal uh, watershed of ridership um, for rapid transit. Uh, but of course, when they got around to building the CTS Rapid, the Van Swergens obviously were long gone. I don't think Nickel Plate had, had any interest in having parallel service through Lakewood and Rocky River alongside um, their line. Uh, which had a lot of intense, uh, great separation. And I, I don't know that Lakewood would, would have been that interested in it. So they really kind of skirted this huge ridership watershed. Um, so that was really kind of a missed opportunity. Um, all right, so here we go to West 117th Station. Um, this was also a station that came you know, very close to just kind of skirting uh, Lakewood. Uh, this is a train actually going towards uh, West Park. Um, when 117th was running before the extension, they used it as a small yard and uh, store trains here. Uh, Rich, uh, Carl, has <clears throat> another question uh, which is sort of interesting. It says, being grade separated, did this rapid transit line have above average running speeds compared yes. to other uh, rapid yeah. lines? Yeah, like as a matter of fact, I had this 
uh, on the previous slide here. Yeah, they were able to do uh, eight miles in 18 minutes, uh, which is a pretty, you know, on the, on the first piece of the rapid, which is a pretty fast average speed for sure. And uh, station spacing was, was not very tight. It wasn't like New York subway or Chicago. They had pretty, uh, pretty far station spacing. So they could achieve, you know, um, very, a very good high speed and a good average operating speed. These cars were 48 mile an hour cars. The cars that they bought subsequent to that were 55 mile an hour cars. Um, they did make a few modifications on these cars. Now that we're kind of around that subject. Uh, the original cars were delivered with a fairly narrow pantograph head. And these cars had a tendency to kind of rock and roll quite a bit, uh, particularly in curves. And what, what was happening is they were actually overrunning the catenary. So they would overrun the catenary, the pantograph would go up, tang one to the hangers. So that was an issue. So they put a larger pantograph on the car, bigger pantograph head. And they had issue with the brakes. Now, these cars were PCC, PCC type technology cars, kind of similar to Chicago, but no track brakes and air systems. Of course, Chicago cars were all electric. So these cars did have air. So now we go on to the opening of the West Park branch. And again, the West Park branch was financed by the sale of Harvard Yard. Um, it was about $8 million to build that, that two miles. Um, so the original terminal station was to be called West 143rd and Lorraine. This is kind of a neat story I found out just recently. It's amazing when you when you are uh, putting these presentations together, you're doing research research the stuff that you that you find. So what I found out was uh, Bill Vigris uh, actually sent a letter to Don Hyde suggesting that the name of the station be West Park rather than the 143rd and Lorraine because West Park was a New York Central Railroad Station site. And it was also the name of the village, West Park. That part of Cleveland is called West Park, got its name from the village. And he thought that was a much more appropriate name uh, for, West, for that station than 143rd and Lorraine. And, uh, and because of that, he got to actually ride an opening day on the train with mayor, the mayor and other dignitaries. Uh, so it was kind of, it was kind of neat. So here we are, the rapid transit extension. This extension uh, was so popular, again, because of that Lakewood ridership, watershed, even though they never were able to penetrate Lakewood, they came kind of on the side of Lakewood. Uh, the Triscuit, Triscuit Station, which was new, and West Park Station, which was new here, uh, the ridership was so heavy that, that within a week or two, the, the parking lots were totally jammed. And so CTS actually built another 1,000 parking spots at these two stations uh, to carry the load. And of course, back at the time, when you think they, you know, the freeway, the freeway network was not built out, obviously, back in this time period in the 50s, 58. So if you lived in western Cleveland or in the western suburbs, there was just no really good way to get into downtown. And of course, downtown was the big employment center. Uh, not just the downtown itself, but also the industrial area that surrounded downtown it was a huge employment center. In fact, it was the biggest employment center in the state of Ohio. It was a huge industrial, Cleveland was a huge industrial giant at the time. So there was no really great way. I think people forget that. I mean, you, you'd have to slug it out going down the rain road or some arterial road to get all the way downtown. So the, so the rapid was just a huge time saver for people that lived either on the east side or the west side. It was, it was just a boom. So when the uh, West Park extension uh, um, was made, was, was uh, developed, uh, they knew they needed to have additional cars because the, the original line from Windermere um, to 117th was doing so well that it kind of exceeded their ridership expectations and they were and they were having a tough time getting enough vehicles to meet demand so they purchased another 20 uh, St. Louis cars these are called bluebirds in Cleveland uh, to to meet that anticipated demand and the way you can tell the difference between the first order and the second order the way I always tell is to look at the classification lights so the second order they decided to go with classification lights and actually that previous picture we saw of an express train, the white lights were actually lit up on that picture. It's a little hard to see. The older cars just had a single light here. So that's how you can kind of tell the 
fleets. So West Park Yard was a was a sizable uh, yard uh, where they could lay up trains. Uh, they didn't do any servicing here. Um, and it was just, it was a great place to watch trains because the big four right away uh, was right here. So you could uh, get up on the platform. I used to come here with my dad uh, after dinner sometimes in the summertime. And we would just watch uh, freight trains go by because back in the day, uh, New York Central used to run flexi-van trains, they called them at the time. And those trains ran at 79 miles an hour. So they were really flying through here. So it was a fun place to hang out. There was a yard operator here. Uh, full time. My dad knew the yard operators. My dad was a shaker operator. And so it was just a fun place to go as a kid to watch trains, and listen to all kinds of neat stories. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, one unique aspect of Cleveland, I'm showing the interior shot of a blue bird here, as you can see, they were set up for onboard fare collection. So off peak hours uh, with single cars, because the fleet consisted of both single cars and married pairs, the singles were intended for off peak service. So during, during off peak, um, even if you were running a, a, a merry pair, even the merry pairs had pair boxes. And in fact, the air porters, when they came out in 1968, they also had pair boxes because off peak fur collection, they would shut the uh, attendance booths down and they would collect on board the car. So it's kind of a unique feature for a rapid transit. Of course, Chicago did it at Skokie. I think that may have been where, where Cleveland kind of got that idea because I know Bob Korak and Don Hyde and other executives of CTS were visiting back and forth to Chicago, which of course was the closest uh, rail transit system running. Um, so that was kind of a unique feature to have uh, onboard fare collection. So if you're a Clevelander, and I just throw this in for any Clevelanders that are out there, uh, Commander Ray's West Park Chevrolet was like right next to the West Park Rapid Station. And this guy advertised like crazy on television. The, the, the fact that I think the dealership is still there. Radio, television, he had a jingle that if you're from Cleveland, I won't sing the jingle to you. But uh, anybody from Cleveland would remember Commander, Commander Ray's West Park Chevrolet. So I just kind of threw that in as a nod. So, so here we kind of come to the steady state. Uh, this is 1959. So in 58, we were open up to here to West Park. And this was kind of a steady state from 59 until we hit uh, 68, which was when the airport extension uh, came around. So they were very proud of the system. You know, the future looked bright for rapid transit expansion because the, the proof of concept of the original rapid was incredibly successful. Uh, Cleveland was, was very good at uh, integrating bus service with rapid transit service to feed the rapid transit. So of the 74 or so routes that they ran when the uh, rapid opened in 1955, about 42, 45 of those uh, served the rapid transit connected to the rapid transit. So it was a great you know, intermodal planning uh, ahead of its time. They did a very good job at that. So now we hit the fifth year, 1960, things are going well, ridership is very high, uh, uh, parking lots are jammed, development is starting to occur along the rapid transit, like everything's looking like, you know, uh, we're going in the right direction, we're waiting for that subway to materialize to really help distribution through downtown, because up to this point, and we'll find out much later, uh, you know, there was one big station downtown, it was Cleveland Union Terminal, so you had to get off in the terminal, you had to go up a number of ramps to get up to the surface, you got to the front of the terminal tower, and you waited for a loop bus to get to your final destination. We'll talk about that in a little while. So they were, they had put out Don Hyde, just a big transit advocate, big rail rapid transit advocate. They really touted their five-year celebration and all the great progress they had made. This is part of a brochure they put out. And they touted all the real estate development that occurred along the right of way, which, which it did, um, and how, how much time people were saving, you know, the travel time savings of folks, the integration of service with the, with the bus system. Uh, you know, things were going pretty well. So one thing that, that uh, they promoted heavily was Kiss and Ride. Now, other systems had Kiss and Ride, but what Cleveland did that was unique was they put specific Kiss and Ride lanes uh, at close to the rail station entrance, specifically for the purpose of dropping and picking people up 
So you wouldn't have to go into the parking lot. You wouldn't jam up the other driveways or entrances to the station. There was a dedicated area for kissing, right? So they were very, you know, proud of, of what they had done. So they actually reached a high of 80, 85,000 people in 1959 after West Park opened up in a day, which was very high ridership on the system. And again, you know, there were no freeways. So this was a great way to get into town. It was a great travel savings. One thing that I always thought that was odd, we'll talk about this further on too, was the rapid was an express fare. So you had to pay an additional fare if you transferred from bus to get onto rail, which I always thought was kind of crazy. It, you know, it seemed to, um, in the long run, have an impact on ridership, not so much in these early years because they have plenty of ridership. Um, and the odd thing also was if you if you rode in on Shaker Rapid to the terminal and you wanted to get on a loop bus, you paid a transfer because you started on Shaker Rapid and there were no transferring agreements between Shaker and CTS, even for employees. Uh, so you had to pay another fare to get in a loop bus. So there were some deterrents there uh, in ridership. So they treated this as if it was a freeway flyer or an express bus. And so you paid an upcharge on your fare. So we talked a little bit about fan trips. They, they uh, always had kind of wacky fan trips going on uh, back then. This is a, a fan trip where they took two differential dump cars. These are all Cleveland, XCTSS Cleveland Railway differential dumps. These are actually MU, they had uh, HL control, so they could actually MU their work equipment. And they put wood benches inside um, the differential dump and they let people ride around. <laughs> You know, and, and between revenue service trains and a differential dump car, walk around the right way and take photographs. I can't, it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, uh, having been a CEO of a system, somebody asking me if they could do that. You know, uh, insurance and liability would just be a killer to do any of these oddball kind of fan trips anymore. Another one they did, this is a picture from Bill Vigers. They used a line car. Uh, as a on a fan trip to put it out uh, with fans. And this is an old uh, center entrance 1200 car um, that they converted to a line car. So this was a center door um, car, similar to the vehicles that Shaker Heights ran, but they converted it. They should do kind of a sweet job converting this thing to a, to a line car. So now we go on to trackless trolleys. And um, the Reed McCarter plan would have retained uh, about 17 streetcar lines. Uh, and when that plan was shot down in favor uh, of the heavy rail rapid transit, a, a good deal of those lines were uh, converted to trackless trolleys when the streetcars left uh, because they were still very heavy lines. You know, they still carry a lot of people. They still ran on very short headways. Oddly enough, Euclid Avenue, which was the heaviest line in CTS, um, and even was the heaviest line when I was a traffic checker in 1979, 78, uh, they were scheduled, still scheduled for 92nd headway. They never ran trackless trolleys on that uh, line. They never ran PCC cars on that line, which really kind of mystified me. I don't know if they thought the rapid transit would carry some of the burden of the ridership, although the rapid as we'll see later on, you know, it was in the CUT, CUT right away. It was probably, you know, a half a mile or more from Euclid Avenue, which was the heaviest line uh, in the system. So they had a large fleet and they had a modern fleet. So they had a fleet of 461 trolley coaches. They had five builders, 15 routes. Uh, the West Side routes were abandoned in 1958 when the line was extended to West Park. We'll talk about that. And then the East Side Lines uh, ended in 1963. So they had buses um, that were, uh, particularly these Mormon, these 50 Mormon Harringtons that were purchased in 1951. Uh, the most of these coaches were purchased in 47, 48. And as you can see, they were out of service in 58. By 63, they were all gone. So it was a very, you know, a very new fleet, a very low average age fleet. And unfortunately, the, the newest vehicles, these 50 uh, Mormon Harringtons, uh, they were all scrapped. None of them were sold. And now no properties were interested in purchasing the buses, the coaches for some reason. There were a few 47, 48 
uh, Mormons that were sold to Toronto and some were sold to Mexico for parts. But just about everything got scrapped. So uh, kind of interesting dynamic. So I would assume you guys being up in uh, New York, New Jersey, are, you know Jeff Marnoff. And uh, Jeff sends out uh, emails on different topics, probably like a couple a week and all kinds of different things going on across the country. And some focused on the New York, uh, New Jersey area. And so I've been on his mailing list for his email list for quite a few years. And I know he's got, he's got a phenomenal collection of, of everything. And for some reason, I've had just a really difficult time over the years finding any, any pictures of CTS trolley buses, black and white or color. Uh, my dad took a few, uh, but I think he may have, well, he started having kids and he started kind of losing, lost a lot of interest in getting out chasing streetcars, trolley coasters around. But so I asked Jeff, do you have anything? And sure enough, Jeff came up with these fantastic pictures. And uh, I want to make sure I gave him credit because uh, uh, this was a real find to be able to display this. So here we see uh, two 1948 St. Louis trackless trolleys at public score in 1960. Uh, they went to this baby eggshell blue paint job, which I don't know who came up with that. I don't think anybody really ever cared for that, but it was a, a later paint job for Cleveland's trackless trolleys. Here we see one of those brand, one of those new 1951 Mormon Harringtons at Woodhill Car House, 1960. And this must have been some kind of fan trip, fan trip deal because they put a PCC car destination sign up here. Um, and then in, uh, in the CTS system, if you saw something underlined in purple, or excuse me, orange, as you see here, that meant it was a short term. So it was running, it was running in service on West 25th Street and it was going out of service when we hit the car house. Uh, here we see 1951 Mormon Harrington, Marmon Harrington, uh, two of them at uh, Quebec Loop in 1960. Here we see some pictures, uh, uh, 1948 St. Louis, 1951 Marmon at St. Clair, East 152nd Street, St. Clair in 1960. Here you see a picture at East 12th and Scova. This is a St. Louis product. You can see the terminal tower in the background. You can see a lot of heavy industry here. Uh, we see uh, another St. Louis coach uh, rounding uh, out of uh, public square in 1960. And an interesting thing uh, I learned through actually Jeff's pictures and, and, and going back to Blaine Hayes and Jim Tomlin's book was that the 1951 Mor Marmon, I keep saying Mormon, Mar Marmon Harrington was really an attractive trolley coach. I mean, obviously that was the best looking ones that, that CTS had. And just in the industry, I thought it was a great looking coach. And uh, they were actually, this, this coach here, 1324, was shipped to Brussels to be, to be displayed in an auto show because they were so impressed with the style uh, of this bus and the paint job and the looks of this thing. Uh, which is kind of neat. So here it is being loaded on a ship uh, headed for Brussels. And here we wind up, you know, we're winding down towards the end of uh, Trekless Trolley Operation in Cleveland. This is a picture by Bill Vigris. There was a fan trip in 1963 uh, with his coach 874 going around different lines uh, of the city. Here's a picture of uh, Union Avenue line, which was a uh, heavy, heavy industry um, section of Cleveland here. And believe it or not, this bus wound up, this coach wound up at Illinois Railway Museum. It's still there. I believe it's operation. Uh, a group of fans purchased it. They actually shipped it to Chicago and the CTA let them operate this bus, this coach in service on their trackless trial lines, which were still in operation at the time for a couple of fan trips. And again, I can't believe like, you know, back then you could do things like that because nowadays that just probably wouldn't happen. So when, they're, when the rapid was built, um, this is the aerial view of Denison Station. Denison Station provided the biggest uh, fleet storage, maintenance, uh, track, west side, trackless trial lines, Madison Avenue, um, 
streetcar barn here also uh, provided uh, storage for uh, trackless trailer lines. This is a, a uh, picture of a PCC, the last PCC fan trip. Uh, PCCs never ran on the west side. Oh, they definitely never ran on Madison. They did run on the west side. They did never ran on Madison Avenue. So when they had this trip, they did all kinds of kind of oddball routing with the PCC car just to have fun on a fan trip. And so this was, um, Madison Station was part of uh, Hannah. The Hannah family owned uh, a big chunk of the streetcar system in Cleveland. And this was kind of the late 19, late 1800s, early 1900s building here. This was, this was torn down. Uh, part of this was used for parking for the Rapid, but they closed this, they closed Denison, and they built a new Triscuit garage, which is right here. This, this garage is adjacent to Triscuit Rapid Transit Station. It opened in 58. And that was the excuse to say, you know, we, we can't wire up all that uh, deadhead mileage to get those trackless drives from Denison and Madison over to Triscuit. It just wouldn't be economical. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So we're just going to get rid of all the west side lines. This picture here is kind of kind of neat because this is the this is the first transit photo I ever took uh, in 1967. So I was 10 years old. Uh, Triska Garage was not that far from my house, so I went over here and, and took a couple of shots of the uh, bus garage. So this is kind of a kind of a near and dear picture to me. This is a, this is the first transit picture I ever took. So. That was the end of the trackless trolley era. And then, uh, and then of course the East side lines ended in 63. It was kind of funny because, you know, in reading back at the history, you know, CTS management at the time said that there just wasn't enough ridership to justify you know, the use of trackless trolleys. But when I think of the headways they were running uh, on these lines, even when I was a traffic checker, I mean, these were heavy lines that these uh, trackless trolleys were running on. Uh, it's hard to imagine that they didn't justify the, the utility of a big trackless trolley, but I guess there was some rationale behind that. You know, and, and the fleet was very young. That was the other thing we discussed before. The bulk of the fleet was purchased in 47, 48. They had some bus, some approaches there were as new as 1951. So, you know, a, a very young average fleet age <clears throat> and heavy ridership. So I don't quite understand that decision. Um, CTS had a very nice uh, bus fleet. They made major investment in buses. Once they kind of threw out the uh, Reed McCarter plan, which would have resulted in a, a fleet of about between three and 400 PCC cars running in about a 200 block uh, subway east and west from downtown, about 100 blocks in the direction. It would have taken all the streetcars basically out of the heaviest uh, congested corridors in the city, which made a lot of sense, kind of like Philadelphia did or Boston did. Uh, it would have made a lot of sense for the city. Uh, but when they decided to not go in that direction, they made big equipment purchases of trackless trolleys and then diesel buses. They really embraced diesel buses. Um, as the way to go. And so here we see a 1954 uh, General Motors bus. This is on Euclid Avenue downtown. And they were actually the second system in the United States to get new look buses. Washington, D.C. Uh, was the first system to get new look buses. And they were the second ones. They purchased 100 buses. Uh, these were air-conditioned buses, which for the day, 1959, you know, was, was kind of unusual to get into air-conditioned buses at that time. Um, so this was a big deal. This is a page out of the CTS 1959 annual report. They were very proud that they could purchase these buses. And, and those folks that had been around transit agencies for a long time or worked for transit agencies years ago, back in the day, as they say, we used to have uh, equipment replacement funds that were part of our normal budget. So every year, every fiscal year, uh, there was money put aside for equipment purchases. And that's how CTS was able to purchase these vehicles. There was no federal funding. You know, the city, the state wasn't helping them. They were 
using uh, the money they had received uh, from revenue uh, and their equipment replacement uh, funds to leverage bonds to purchase equipment. Uh, you know, nowadays we don't do that. So, you know, we, we, run the, we run our buses into the ground and then we go begging on our hands and knees to the board to purchase buses. And then we start resulting in these 200, 300 plus procurements of buses, which I lived through in Atlanta. It's great if they run good, but if you have 300 buses that have some big fleet defects like we did, uh, and they're parked against the wall, it's kind of tough to provide service. So uh, back in the day, you know, there were regular normal purchases of buses, you know, 50, you know, at a time or so to keep the average fleet age, you know, decent, keep maintenance costs down, and keep new equipment out there. So, so things have changed uh, with agencies. Here we see uh, uh, Flexible. Cleveland bought a lot of Flexibles. Flexibles uh, buses were built in Loudonville, Ohio, which was not that far from Cleveland. They like to kind of purchase back and forth between GM and Flexible. They would kind of rotate fleet procurements uh, to kind of, I guess, keep them both in business and kind of keep them honest and keep them competitive. Uh, so Cleveland had, had a nice fleet of, uh, of uh, buses. Um, they ran a tight ship and, and they ran a tight ship to the end of CTS. The, the fleet looked generally like this appearance here. I mean, they, they, they were well taken care of. Uh, they won, they were the winner of the uh, Fleet Owner Maintenance Efficiency Award for seven years in a row in the 50s and 60s. They were well known for being a very well-maintained, uh, uh, well-managed uh, system and their fleet maintenance for sure. Uh, here we see a, a new look General Motors bus on the east side uh, near Buckeye and Woodville Road in the 1970s. Uh, here we see a 1967 new look at Rapid Transit Station 71. I'm not sure what Rapid Transit Station this is at. Um, somebody will eventually tell me, I'm sure. And they ran a big charter bus service. For those of us that were around kind of pre-FTA, um, a lot of these agencies ran a pretty extensive charter service. And Cleveland ran a big charter service. It was a great way to make money because you have a lot of uh, uh, you know, money invested in, the, in the equipment. A lot of that equipment is sitting around, particularly on the weekends, doing nothing. So you have the capital asset. So, you know, why not throw an operator in there, charge some nice premium fare, and do some charter service? So they were quite big in charter service. They went to Cedar Point, of course, which is a big amusement park. Folks may be familiar with They went to Cleveland Orchestra concerts. They did fall leaf tours. They went to Am Amish country. And they had all these different senior citizens tours that my grandmother used to go on all over Ohio. Uh, so it was a it was a, it was a good revenue stream. They had two uh, purpose built 1969 flexible buses. They called the Charter Chiefs, which had kitchen tables and uh, a bar inside of it. Now, of course, when FTA rolled around, uh, this kind of stopped because. I guess the feeling was, you know, they're paying for your equipment. You're competing with the private sector. That's not fair uh, uh, competitively to do that. So uh, they imposed charter restrictions on agencies, which really limited your ability to run charter service unless it was for uh, at the request of an elected official, we could do that. Or if there was no local capacity with the charter bus uh, operators within your area. But uh, so those things have changed quite a bit. So speaking of uh, extra service, special service, this is a picture older than, this is pre-1955, but just to give you the idea, this is uh, Chief Wahoo, this is the Indians. We can't, we don't use the name Indians anymore. These are the guardians now. Uh, Chief Wahoo is gone, but this is Municipal Stadium. And they ran a tremendous amount of service for uh, Browns games, which were played in the same stadium and Indians baseball games. And what they used to do was they would take these, these big regular routes, like say in my neighborhood was Detroit Avenue, Madison, Clifton, and they would run, they would run regular route. Uh, and then when they got close to the city, they would transfer over to the freeway network down the Memorial Shoreway running express to the stadium. So they ran regular route 
but then express to the stadium. And, and they ran the service when they were games. The buses were especially marked, the stations were especially marked for um, sporting events. And they carried a tremendous amount of people, even through the 70s, uh, to games. It was, it was a big deal. It was a lot of fun. So kind of an early consolidation attempt uh, was made by CTS to purchase uh, other bus uh, providers. And here's a number of what they purchased um, between 1955 and 1975. So we have Lakewood Rapid Transit, 1954. Picture on the right is of the Lakewood Transit bus garage, which is at, on, at Atkins and Lakewood, a couple blocks over from where I grew up. That building is actually still there. They bought the uh, Broadview Bus Line 61, Redderford Bus 1964, and the Bria Bus Line in 1968. So I always kind of wonder, you know, uh, CTS ran out, had a lot of routes that ran outside of the limits of the city of Cleveland uh, into what would be the inner ring suburbs. A lot of uh, flyer service, freeway flyer service when the freeway system was built out later on. And, and I always wondered, like, why would why would, an, why would an agency like CTS that ran outside the limits of the city purchase other bus systems? Because nowadays we wouldn't be interested in doing that, generally speaking, because anytime we would purchase another bus company, we'd be purchasing a liability because we subsidize service. You know, we don't run out of the fare box anymore. Well, back when these systems were being bought, by CTS and they were expanding their service into other areas of the city, most of which they were already operating in. Um, these, these systems were either making money or they were breaking even at the time, as was CTS. CTS made a profit until 1967, ran out of the fare box until about 1973. So they weren't really big liabilities to them because they were either breaking even or they were making money and they were able to reconfigure their system because they were already running, for instance, in Lakewood uh, and, other, and other areas, and they were able to kind of consolidate uh, or enhance the service they were already providing in those areas. So I thought that was kind of neat that they made this kind of early <clears throat> consolidation effort. So one of the issues that happened is when they didn't build the streetcar subway, which was the Reed McCarter plant, which would have taken all these surface transit vehicles out of downtown Cleveland um, and reduce congestion considerably, they just replaced the streetcars with additional surface vehicles, trolley buses and diesel buses, which, so the congestion downtown was never, was never relieved. And of course, when they built the rapid transit, the hope was they were gonna build a subway which would have relieved some congestion, but getting in, getting in and out of downtown Cleveland, as it was with a lot of Midwest cities at the time and Eastern cities back in this time period, was just really painful to get in and out of the city. The parking situation was, was terrible. The congestion was horrible. Um, and I put the put Yogi Berra's uh, quote down there because, you know, it was so congested and crowded. And I think this was kind of Albert Porter's mantra too, you know, it's just too crowded, no one goes there anymore. Which eventually became you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy because it was so hard to get in and out of downtown Cleveland and it became easier and easier to go to suburbia with the expanding freeway system that it, it did eventually uh, really damage um, downtown Cleveland, although it took many years for that decline to occur, but it did occur. So now we get into the great downtown Cleveland subway battle, which pretty, pretty much everybody always asks about when you get onto the topic of Cleveland Transit. So here's Albert Porter. Uh, he was a, a big shot in Cleveland. He was the county engineer for a long period of time, 47 to 76. He was the father of the suburban freeway system, ardent rail transit opponent. And he had the additional power of being ch chairman of the Cuyahoga County Democrat Party. So he had a lot of leverage, <clears throat> both as a county engineer and shaping trans transportation plans within the county. And also because he had such a strong position within the Democratic Party, which basically ruled Cuyahoga County and um, the city of Cleveland for many, many years. So on the other side, we have Don Hyde. I've been talking about Don Hyde throughout the presentation. 
uh, Don Heide was a, a, a long-term um, CTS uh, management employee. Um, when McCarter left to go to Chicago to head the CTA, he was the first general manager of the Chicago Transit Authority. Don Heide stepped in as general manager from 1947-1966. Uh, when he left in 66, he did consulting like I'm doing now in retirement. And he was just a really strong rapid transit um, advocate and a very strong subway advocate. And even when he was, you know, not the general manager anymore, he was still in, in the news, uh, in the media, you know, pushing for subway expansion and rapid transit expansion in the Cleveland region. He was just, he was a true believer. Uh, the guy was just a really dedicated uh, transit professional. He did a lot for the city and did a tremendous amount for, for CTS. He was at the helm for a long time and ran a, a, a tight ship. And in fact, when he left in 66, the system was still actually turning a profit. Although it was a small one, it was still turning a profit. So he was the uh, opponent of, uh, of Porter. And he, and he took Porter on in the media. He wrote editorials. He, he went on the radio. He had debates at the city club. I mean, he just he just took Porter on, you know, head on. He basically called him, you know, a liar, misinformed. And, you know, they were really um, wrestling with each other for many, many years. Of course, Porter uh, went out in the end, but he was uh, he's a big part of uh, of transit, Cleveland Transit. So this was the original subway uh, proposal. Uh, so you can see. A lot of junctions here, very tight curves, um, which is why those short rapid transit cars were selected because they were intended to operate in the subway. So it made a lot of sense to have smaller, shorter cars. There was a kind of a debate on and off about whether a shaker would operate in the subway or not operate the subway. The Pullman cars were. Um, Pullman PCC cars that were bought in 1948 by Shaker were designed with a left-hand door like Boston to run in subway. Um, there was some debate at the end whether Cleveland, um, whether Shaker would really want to run in the subway. Uh, it would have added a lot of extra running time without a lot of additional ridership from their perspective uh, and increased operating costs. So there's, you know, depending on what you read, there's kind of a debate about whether Shaker really wanted to be in the subway or not wanted to be or didn't want to be in the subway, they would have, would have had to build, um, kind of like they did in Pittsburgh, dual height platforms where you have low platform section of the station and a high platform level of the station. It could have obviously worked technically. There was some debate about whether you should, you should mix, um, you know, PCC type streetcars and the subway with heavy rail transit, which I thought was odd because they were already doing that in the joint area for years. And without any issues, you know, with a good single system and well-trained employees, it just wasn't a problem, but that was used as an excuse with the subway. So an, an alternative subway proposal that I'd like to talk about a little bit, and this goes back to, you know, um, when the, when the uh, Duluth Rapid Transit Plan decided that, you know, kind of a cost-effective way was to get in this joint area, CUT right away that the Van Sorgens had built for the Cleveland Interurban uh, Rapid Transit to get into their development and terminal tower. You know, it was cheap to build to to build at grade and build in this joint area with Shaker. The real ridership was up here on Euclid Avenue, where you see this dashed line. That was the heaviest streetcar line, heaviest bus line, probably still is one of the heaviest lines. Um, in Cleveland, uh, the dual hub quarter BRT projects sort of kind of runs on a, on a lot of this area down Euclid Avenue. So that ridership has always been there. So one of the proposals was not only to build the downtown loop subway, but to relocate the CTS rapid transit up onto Euclid Avenue in a subway, which is where it probably really should have been in the first place. And then Shaker would have just continued to use the right of way uh, into the terminal and then CTS would have, Rapid Transit would have used the Euclid subway and would have uh, run through this uh, downtown distribution subway, uh, which Shaker could have run into had they wanted to do so. So in 1955, they, they uh, 
decided to do another study of the uh, county, the one of the multitude of subway studies that were done in Cleveland to see whether it was really still a, a good idea or not to build the subway. So they did some neat station renderings of the um, the firms, the firms that worked together, this Prager lighting Delu. Delu is of course Charles Delu, which was the big uh, rapid transit highway guy in Chicago. It was his firm. Here's a rendering of what could have been a station at East 13th and Euclid Station, Euclid Avenue. This is a stack station, which is kind of neat. We have we have one stack station in Atlanta on the uh, east west line. This is a station at East Ninth and Huron. This is a rendering again from the same uh, from the same operational operation the feasibility study of 1955. Uh, so, in addition to doing the, uh, the study, Porter thought, well, you know, we really need to go out and do a scientific survey of people who are actually riding trains to see whether they would actually use it or not. Uh, and you know we'll kind of we'll kind of take a look at that at the same time we're doing this study. We'll kind of do a double check here, you know. So he decided to do this uh, scientific survey, hand out these cards to riders uh, to determine, you know, whether you would use this thing or not. Why are you riding transit in the first place? All that kind of stuff. Um, so they hired uh, Case Tech students um, to go on ride on uh, transit vehicles and do the survey in 1955. Never, I've never seen any comprehensive results of the survey. Uh, if they were positive, I'm sure the reporter would not have wanted to share that with anybody particularly. Um, so I never really have dug up anything about the results of the survey. Um, but the uh, decision, decision wound up um, in this 1959, December 16, 1959 uh, meeting. Uh, with the county commissioners, three county commissioners. So uh, the guy on the left here uh, uh, was a Republican commissioner that was not in favor, that was opposed to the subway. He was an existing commissioner. The guy on the right was a Democrat. He was in favor of the subway. The poor guy in the middle here looking all dejected. Well, this guy probably, the guy on the right probably looks even worse. He was a young commissioner. He was a Democrat. The reason I bring up the party again is because um, Porter was the chairman of the Cuyahoga County Democratic Party, and I'm sure the guy in the center being a young commissioner, young politician, I'm sure he must have strong armed him to some degree uh, to realize the error of um, building a subway for Cleveland. So he was the he was the deciding vote. He voted against the subway, and that pretty much just put the subway plan um, that was the death of the subway. So unfortunately, it never took off. I never uh, was revived again. So we were back to riding the loop bus. So again, you had a you had a transfer in the lower levels of the terminal. Get up here to the front of Cleveland Union Terminal and load on uh, these loop buses. Now you can imagine. I remember this, you know, not only as a kid, but when I was going to university, and I was a traffic checker too. Um, you know, when when a train, when a rapid transit, you know, a six car rapid transit train comes into the terminal and and offloads, you know, three four hundred people, and they make their way up the ramps up here. You can just imagine the congestion of getting all these loop buses uh, in and out of the out of public square on these loop bus routes. I mean, it was just phenomenal congestion. They used to have starters. They would uh, they would open up the back door of the bus. They would have a small fare box and they would also take transfers from folks who didn't have transfers like shaker riders who needed to pay a fare. And they would load these buses through the back door and the front door and the starter would blow a whistle and then the buses would take off. It was just a, a phenomenal, uh, really heavy uh, uh, bus routes. It was a tough way to provide distribution through downtown. So that's kind of the subway story. So the next battle was really for rapid transit expansion. And it's my way or the highway that's pretty much uh, Albert Porter. 
So we kind of go into that next discussion. So this was the, and this is actually out of the 1955 uh, plan, freeway plan. Uh, the dashed lines here show the rapid transit expansion, extensions that were proposed for uh, the existing rapid transit, which is in the dark here going to West Park and then over to Windermere. These are the Shaker Heights. This is the Van Aken line down here. This is the Green Road line here. So if you, if you took this um, diagram and you overlaid it on the Van Swergen's plans, it's pretty much identical, very close. And if you actually took this and you laid it out on top of the interurban network that served uh, Cleveland, it's very close to that as well. So it just kind of shows you that the arterials, the transportation corridors are the transportation corridors, still are the main transportation corridors. So really Don Hyde and CTS, you know, their vision was to really build out everything you see here in the, in the dash lines and the subway. Had that, had that occurred, um, Cleveland have had, would have had a hell of a good transit system and they would have been less reliant on a lot of the surface bus transportation and really congested corridors, they would have had a hell of a system. And Cleveland was kind of uniquely situated to be able to, to build this out because there was a lot of available right of way because there was so much railroad traffic in and out of Cleveland. Uh, major, uh, what we would call class one railroads today that came in and out of Cleveland. So there was a lot of right of way that was available to build this. Um, and it would have been quite a network. Uh, so, really not much of any that you see anything that you see here except for the uh, expansion to the airport uh, ever occurred. And the reason it didn't, of course, was because the highway system expanded. Um, and there was just this competition between um, highway folks and transit folks, which I thought was interesting when I read the 1955 report because um, it says something quite different in here. So first, you know, we decided to do this uh, this very scientific report. Uh, we actually had computers back then, we collected data, we used punch cards. I still remember using punch cards in the 70s when I was going to university. And, and we had this very attractive lady that collated things and sorted things and tabulated things and ran the computer. So we knew this was a very scientific you know, analysis. Uh, and actually it was, it was a very good analysis. If you go back and read the report, you look at the data, uh, you look at the ridership, you look at the network that they were proposing, it made a lot of sense. It really did. And it still probably does, you know, to this day as well. But one of the things I found in the report that I thought was really interesting, and again, Delu was involved in this report. Of course, Delu um, was the big Chicago developer of freeways. And, and Delu was, a, uh, if you look at Chicago, Dan Ryan Expressway, other freeways, uh, you know, in, in Deleuze's mind, he saw that, that rail, rapid transit, and the freeway system could work together. And that was one of the conclusions of the report was the proposed rapid transit system, you can see highlighted yellow, and the proposed freeway system complemented each other and together could provide a well-balanced transportation for Cleveland and the metropolitan area. And so they saw that the rapid transit, if you kind of Look at the stuff below here in the last paragraph. They kind of saw the rapid transit as during the peak hour, the most congested hours of the day, really uh, diverting a tremendous amount of automobiles off the freeway network onto the rail system, and then of course out of downtown. You know, it, it just makes so much logic. It makes so much sense, but obviously it didn't make sense to the right people because uh, they saw this as particularly in Porter's mind, and I'm sure others. They saw rapid transit the highways as being uh, not being complementary at all, but being at odds with each other. It was kind of an either or proposition, either do the highways or do rapid transit expansion. And highways is that that's the new thing, it's the modern thing, it's you know, that's what we want. So kind of interesting to see that that uh, even the results of the 1955 study, which was supposed to be the study uh, to look at uh, freeways and uh, rapid transit you know, came to a reasonable conclusion. Um, so back in 1944, this was the original uh, freeway plan for the city of Cleveland. And as you can see, um, 
there wasn't a lot kind of slicing up the neighborhoods. The freeway system kind of went around Cleveland, not necessarily through the urban core, cutting up uh, neighborhoods within the urban core of the city. Um, but that's not what happened uh, because the freeway plan, uh, this is actually a traffic flow map, but you can see these are, these are the proposed, this is the proposed freeway system here on the east side and the west side. Um, so a, 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 a big uh, urban freeway network that would have just and did uh, decimate very strong uh, middle-class working neighborhoods is very some, as well as some, you know, middle-class affluent neighborhoods were affected by the freeway system as well. But this was the idea to build this system up. And they started building it up. They started working on it. And they started really working first more on the lower west side of Cleveland, which we'll see. Um, but what really got the attention of folks was this area over here to the, to the right. And we'll kind of talk about that. So what you see in red here uh, was the uh, freeway system that was going to be built on the east side of Cleveland, which would, would have really uh, just sliced through some um, really solid inner city neighborhoods that were still hanging in there. They were low to lower middle class, working people, uh, a lot of still um, ethnic neighborhoods of you know, Polish people and Hungarians and, and good sized neighborhoods of African Americans. They were just, you know, they were hanging in there working class people doing their thing. And then it also cut through some of the some of the best areas of the city, including Cleveland, Cleveland Heights and Shaker Heights um, and University Circle, which is still a very prominent uh, area of the city, a lot of cultural area and a big medical facility area it would have just sliced up this, this entire section of the city. And so that really got the attention of a lot of people. Uh, but again, they had already started kind of here on the west side building freeway. So that, that work was already going on. So it motivated, and here's kind of a bit better snapshot. You had the Heights Freeway, the Leaf Freeway, which was north and south. You had the Clark Freeway, which is an extension freeway uh, from the west side cutting into the east side. And of course, the outer belt down here, which was going to be built anyway, that was really wasn't necessarily cutting up uh, the inner cities. But I think people saw as the as the West Side freeway system was implemented, and I lived in the lower, not lower West Side, but I lived in West Boulevard area of Cleveland, and my neighborhood was just absolutely torn up um, by the freeway system and separated. Um, and then when I moved out to Lakewood, unfortunately, the same thing happened to us when we wound up in Lakewood. Um, our neighborhood got torn up um, for a freeway system as well. So one of the concepts, believe it or not, I know this is kind of hard to see, but in the middle of this rendering, this is Shaker Heights Rapid Transit. So one of the concepts was to actually put the freeway into the rapid transit right away up to Shaker Square and then through Shaker through that beautiful, those beautiful, if you've ever been to Shaker Heights and between those, it's just beautiful mansions and big properties and beautiful neighborhoods and uh, landscaped areas and parks. And this is kind of, I think, this is to represent St. Luke's Hospital over here on the left, I think. So that was actually one of the right-of-way alternatives that was looked at. So one of the things that really kind of triggered a lot of opposition to east side freeway construction was that one of the freeways uh, would have gone through uh, the Shaker Lakes. And Shaker Heights has this series of lakes that are really beautiful uh, uh, recreation facilities and just, just a wonderful park system to be part of. And so one of the freeways was actually gonna go right through this lake. And this is Horseshoe Lake and Shaker Heights. Elder Porter called it the Little Duck Pond. And that made a big splash uh, not just in the Cleveland area, but actually nationally, uh, became a symbol of um, the appetite for free freeways just gobbling up, you know, every piece of open right away they could get their hands on. So this was kind of a rallying cry uh, for folks. Uh, and you started seeing, you know, editorials like this about how the how freeways are just gobbling up our homes and property and lakes and landscaping and parks and, you know, you know, enough is enough here, you know, where, where this is really kind of destroying the city, which it did. 
And so that was kind of a rallying cry uh, for a lot of folks. And then one thing that, that occurred at the time was, was Carl Stokes became mayor. Uh, he was the 51st mayor of the city of Cleveland. Uh, he was the first African-American elected to any top 10 major US city. Of course, Cleveland was like seventh at the time. So this was a big deal uh, for Carl Stokes to be elected. And the thing to keep in mind at the time, you know, doing, doing um, uh, my research was, I mean, Cleveland today is predominantly majority African-American city. Back then, Cleveland population was about 38% African-American. So there's no way Carl Stokes could have got elected without having a, a lot of, uh, what in Cleveland we see ethnic populations, which is the Slavic population, you know, Slovaks, Hungarians, Czechs, those folks supporting him. And he had tremendous amount of support from the business community. So here you had this, you had this energetic young guy, young kids, young family, well-educated. He was a product of Cleveland. Uh, he grew up in the uh, in a, uh, the projects in Cleveland on the east side. Uh, his father died when he was very young. He dropped out of school. He went to work to support the family. Um, he pulled himself up by his bootstraps. He got an education. He got a law degree. He opened up a law firm. And, you know, he was really very well liked by the business community and by the general population of the city of Cleveland. So the reason we bring him up is because he stopped some of this madness. And I think by this point, they could see the destruction that was occurring on the west side of Cleveland because of the freeway construction and Carl Stokes and others, and we'll go through some of the others, um, got involved and said, really, like, this, enough is enough. We're not gonna be destroying the whole fabric of the community to provide rapid transportation inside out of Cleveland because how much is Cleveland is gonna be left if we pave the whole thing? you know, what's going to happen to downtown? We make it easier for people to get all over the region and we're going to just dilute our population. Uh, so uh, he was very opposed to, to building the East Side Freeway system. He was a, a great communicator. He could handle the media very well. He was a smooth guy. He looked good on camera. In fact, he became a reporter in New York, I think for NBC, later on in his career. Um, and he wound up hiring a very competent uh, group of people. There, there were people who came from all over the uh, United States to be part of this, this new young progressive guy who had this vision for this you know, Midwest industrial city that was going to really move it forward and was going to tackle these major uh, urban issues that were occurring at the time in inner city neighborhoods. And so he, he, uh, he built a cabin of people that were incredibly talented in, in finance and administration and planning. And one of the folks he hired was Norm Krumholtz. He was the city planning director from 69 to 79. So he went through a lot of successive administrations of mayor, but Carl Stokes was the guy who hired him in the first place. He eventually became a university press professor at Cleveland State, which was my university in 79. I was gone by that time. He was very much opposed to the, the urban freeway system and cutting up the core in the neighborhoods of Cleveland, but he was not a big proponent of rail transportation. So we'll kind of see that later. So he started this movement called equity planning, which is still my degrees in planning. There's probably other people on this call with degrees in planning. Equity planning is kind of considered a new thing now in the past 10 years or so, but he started this movement back in the 60s, late 60s. And his big thing was, you know, uh, those of us who were around at the time remember the whole urban renewal movement where we were tearing up parts of cities and neighborhoods to build these mega structures and parking lots. And it was all very uh, developer centric, you know, big business centric. A lot of it was good for some of these cities, but it tore, it tore up uh, some big neighborhoods and big parts of downtown that were very kind of vibrant at the time to replace them and, and just kind of wiped out a lot of these neighborhoods. And so his big thing was we have to invest in the neighborhoods. We can't just put all of our investment in these mega developments within the urban core because we're losing population in the neighborhoods and we have a lot of issues in the neighborhoods that are, are not being addressed. And we need to really kind of turn inside and pay more attention to the, the equity issues uh, that these big developments are and the burden these developments are putting on the people who actually live in the city. 
Um, so he was a big proponent of that. Um, so he was very opposed to the build out of the freeway system on the on the east side. And again, the west side was already gone. I mean, it was like gone. Another person who was kind of instrumental in this struggle for uh, kind of reducing the impact of freeways on the east side was Paul Jones. Paul Jones actually was an engineer for the Van Swergens, was instrumental in uh, Cleveland Interurban Railroad. Uh, I have pictures of him riding the first, you know, posing with the first train, Cleveland Interurban train, uh, leaving the Union Terminal uh, when the uh, joint area was completed. He became the director of transportation for Shaker Rapid in 1944, and then he became the mayor of 61 to 73. So he became pretty influential. Shaker Heights was always a very influential uh, area, a lot of wealth, a lot of lawyers, a lot of corporate people. Uh, back in this time period, uh, Cleveland had the second or third largest uh, concentration of Fortune 500 companies in the US because it was such an industrial giant. I mean, it was just a huge industrial giant. And of course, the center for railroads because of the Van Swergen Railroad Empire as well. Um, and it was the, it had the second highest concentration of corporate lawyers, apparently I read uh, in the US next to New York City. So it's, uh, it was a big prominent city and this guy was from a very prominent suburb and he was against obviously uh, cutting up his city with, um, freeways, there was also a local groundswell uh, of some ladies who were in women's, women's clubs in uh, Shaker Heights and Cleveland Heights who kind of banded together, created a grassroots uh, effort to get the attention of politicians um, like Stokes and Mayor Jones and others at the state level uh, to stop this madness and to not cut up Shaker Heights with uh, freeways. So there was also a grassroots effort that really caught the attention of politicians who really uh, felt like they needed to take some action. So that was a positive kind of grassroots effort. And then of course, Governor Rhodes also got uh, in the mix of things. And we used to call him Governor Rhodes. You can see in yellow there, like Rhodes, R-O-A-D-S, because he was a big freeway proponent across the entire uh, state. He was a big, a big highway guy. Uh, so he, he would have more naturally been on the side of freeway construction. He would generally not have been opposed to it. But since he was running for election, he needed the votes of the prominent folks in Shaker Heights, the prominent Republicans, to get him in and keep him in office. So he took a, a natural kind of stance uh, to oppose uh, the construction of the freeway uh, network on the east side. So in the long run, um, the movement to, to uh, kill the East Side Freeway Network was successful. So you can see here in this modern view of the freeway network around Cleveland, the East Side has no purple blue coming through this area. These are just arterials in red. There's no freeway system here cutting up the East Side of Cleveland. My side of Cleveland, the west side of Cleveland, you can see got cut up pretty severely by, by freeways. And uh, the mayor before Carl Stokes, Loker, and others were around. And I've read were really regretted the decisions that were made and that the fact that they didn't oppose it as uh, more severely than they did because it really uh, hurt an area of the city that was already struggling to begin with. This was this uh, lower west side of Cleveland, again, was a lot of, you know, working class people. They were just, you know, hanging in there uh, and keeping the city still as a pretty vibrant city. Um, but it just really sliced up um, the west side. And I, I come from Lakewood here, so the freeway came within about when my parents were looking for a house, the realtor said, oh, no, that fruit is not going anywhere near here. It's going to be over in Cleveland. They're not going to touch Lakewood. So we buy the house, and sure enough, like uh, six or eight houses away from us, they're <laughs> building the freeway system. Um, my parents really struggled with, um, my dad was a city kid. My mother grew up in the city. 
They wanted to stay in the city. They did not want to go to the suburbs. It was a very hard decision where we had a, uh, you know, a whole culture of society that we were part of, our, our church, our school, uh, our shops, our bakeries and all that. We were very comfortable in, in our neighborhood uh, on the west side. We were kind of in this Denison, uh, West Boulevard area. I really can't show very well on the map. This is Denison here. Um, so it was, it was a painful decision to move out of Cleveland to get to this, the, uh, inner, of course, it was an entering suburb. We didn't move away out to Westlake or Avon or anything, 20 miles out of the city. My dad would have never done that. Uh, he wanted to be close to the rapid because he was an operator and he needed to get to work sometimes with his splits, you know, four times a day back and forth. So, but a lot of people made that painful decision at this point, you know, to, to start getting out of the city. Um, so that hurt the city quite a bit. Uh, okay, so other major news, and I, you know, I bring these things up because, um, you know, not only are they historical, but they had an influence on the development of transit, uh, not just on uh, other events. So some of these, this political stuff that I mentioned, uh, some of these events I'm gonna be talking about definitely had an influence. Uh, what was going on in the transit scene as well, but, and altered some of the uh, planning. So one of the, the first big things that happened during this period of time, uh, 1966, this was before uh, Stokes was in as mayor, there were the Huff riots. And of course these riots, you know, they exploded all over the country. Those that have, also, those of us that have lived through that era remember this quite well. It was really shocking to the entire population of the, of the area and the country to see this kind of, um, these kind of, this kind of civil, this, you know, uh, I wanna say disorder, but you know, these, these activities going, going on. And this was the, this was the first big ride in Cleveland was in the Huff area. Um, there were, this was an area of 65,000 residents. So, so yeah, that's a lot of people crammed into a small you know, neighborhood. This was a very densely populated neighborhood. Um, used to be a lot of um, eth ethnic white folks that lived here. It became an African-American neighborhood. However, the businesses remained white owned. Uh, there were no parks or recreation facilities. The schools were just crap. Um, the city services were terrible. And back then, uh, Cleveland had uh, black police officers, but they were segregated. Uh, so it was just kind of a tinderbox, you know, uh, and uh, it just kind of ignited like it did across the country. Um, so this uh, four people were dead, 50 were injured, and there were 273 arrests made. Um, but it wasn't over with. It, 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 didn't, uh, it didn't stop. It just kind of quelled itself for a while, I guess. And then the next big one was the Glenville riot, 1968. Now this was during the Stokes administration when Mayor Stokes was mayor. And uh, I really heard his, his program that he was pushing at the time. Uh, but this was a, a four hour gun battle. There were seven dead, three of them were police officers, three of them were so-called militants and there was one bystander. But what really happened was it was kind of an ambush of the police uh, caused by a, a militant who uh, kind of trapped the police uh, and ambushed them and created this huge civil unrest that went on for, for days. Um, so Stokes, Stokes was mayor at the time. He was, he was highly criticized for the way he handled the situation. Um, I'm not sure how much of that was really justified at the time I was a young kid. So, uh, but there was criticism about the way he handled the police department, what he permitted them to do or not to do, uh, how much protection he was really able to offer people living in the neighborhood. Uh, the National Guard eventually got called in to kind of uh, tamp all this thing down. But one of the things that it really hurt uh, was he had this Cleveland Now program, which was put together to some degree by uh, Krumholtz, the equity planning guy. Uh, where he wanted to make a major investment in the neighborhoods in, uh, in Cleveland. So he developed this, uh, it was called Cleveland Now, which was a public-private part partnership for funding uh, neighborhoods to, to uh, improve uh, inner city neighborhoods in Cleveland. 
The idea was to raise over $1.5 billion over a 10 year period. He got $177 million committed for the first two years. Uh, a lot of that money coming from the private sector side through a partnership, uh, levering, leveraging uh, public funds. So they were gonna intend on uh, putting money towards youth activities, employment, building community centers, health clinics, housing, and doing some economic revival in inner city neighborhoods. And when this Glenville riot occurred, they felt like the mayor had lost control of the city. Um, and the other thing they found out was the, the, the key kind of militant that shot first at the police and kind of organizes am, ambush, Fred Ahmad Evans, uh, received $6,000 from the Cleveland Now program somehow. So they used that as a reason to say that Stokes was just headed in the wrong direction. Although the Cleveland Now program actually did turn out to be a success. Uh, and it went on for many years. In fact, it went on until 1980 uh, when, when the program finally ended with money, a couple hundred thousand dollars still left in the bank. So it was a success despite its rough start. Uh, the other thing that happened during this period was the folks may remember the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. It was in it so much that the water caught on fire. It was all the chemicals floating on the top of the water. Um, this was really, per, uh, really uh, precipitated by a lot of industrial runoff from industries. And Cleveland had a very inadequate sewer system at the time. It dumped a lot of water into waterways, the lake and the river. Um, and this kind of paved the way for the Clean Water Act of 1972. This made national news. This was uh, pointed to as, you know, uh, an er early environmental disaster um, that uh, we needed to take action nationally to, to, um, to help mitigate. So um, Stokes got involved. He used his media savvy to get on the news, to be a proponent of um, cleaning this up and it wound up with a $100 million bond uh, for sewer improvements in the city of Cleveland, eventually the development of a regional uh, water and sewer uh, system. Um, Stokes never saw himself as an environmentalist. He'd be the first guy to tell you that from what I read. He was very concerned that, um, that there'd be a lot of attention uh, brought on the uh, stopping pollution and it would detract from other, the other core urban issues like employment and housing. Um, so to some degree, he was probably correct on that. But um, So all of this basically just accelerated suburbanization, people getting the heck out of the city if they could, um, and just really um, starting to do population decline, which really started big time in the 70s. Although the downtown remained very strong through the 70s and the 80s. Um, but, you know, initially, uh, the freeway system, you know, they, these were bedroom communities. You still, you still came to work downtown or you came to work at the steel mill or the auto plants or, or um, tool and die companies or machine shops around the, uh, the city. Um, and then eventually, uh, entertainment, entertainment opportunities and, and shopping opportunities with the development of malls in the suburbs started pulling people away from the city. But uh, even until the eighties, um, there were still three department stores downtown. There were still movie theaters downtown. There were still um, um, live theater and plays uh, at Playhouse Square. Um, it was still a very vibrant community. So it took a long time for Cleveland, the real Cleveland downtown Cleveland to really decline, but it did. And a lot of that had to do with Porter's vision of this mega freeway system. Um, and then of course there was the eventual development of, of uh, new downtowns outside downtown. They were easier to get to from the suburbs, which really hurt everything. So uh, I think rapid transit would have made, the development of the rapid transit would have made a big change in this, um, but it never happened. So now we, got, we go on to the airport extension and I call that the one that got away because I always wondered like Porter was so opposed to other, all these other freeway uh, rapid transit expansions and uh, freeway corridors. Why would he have been okay 
with the airport extension. So we'll kind of talk about that uh, as we go along. So Cleveland did have a, uh, what they call it an express bus connecting downtown uh, to the airport. But as you can see, it was a pretty circuitous um, route. It did go over to uh, NASA. This is where you see airport lab, uh, the, the old tank plant. So, uh, and they went down arterial. So you went down Triscuit Road, Rocky River Drive, these are all city streets. Uh, it must have been a heck of a long ride. Uh, probably took you all day to get there. Uh, not the best connection to get to the airport. So again, back to the creative financing. Um, actually, the board had approved in 1960 a plan, the plans to extend to the airport, but the board didn't have any money. But they did set it as a priority. Uh, so again, back to, back to the creative mix of financing. Uh, in order to build the uh, airport extension, there were five million dollars from county bonds, which was the first time the county really ever kicked any money for rapid transit expansion. Expansion, which was a real surprise. Uh, there was eight hundred thousand dollars from the city of Cleveland for parking that was dedicated for parking improvements. Uh, and then there was $2 million back from that equipment replacement fund, uh, some creative financing. And then eventually there was a, uh, a grant for, of $6.7 million from housing and urban development because back then UMTA was not around. It was HUD. And the HUD was, wanted a, a demonstration project for a proof of concept for connecting uh, airport with the downtown uh, center. Um, and they picked this project as being uh, one that was affordable and pretty easy to implement. Um, the original price tag was $14.5 million and it raised up to $18.6 million. Uh, so for those, that, those of you that may remember Carl Sally, or maybe some people want to call it, remember Carl. Uh, Carl Sally was uh, at one time general manager of uh, Seattle Metro, long-term long uh, transit career guy. Uh, he um, worked for Ed Hutt at the time. He worked for me when I was in Houston and told me that they were just dying to hand out money because that's what, you know, what they, what their ta what they were tasked with was to find projects, to spend money, to prove that the feds could make an impact in funding um, urban transit. So this was a great project to do that. So these were some pictures that I took when I was a kid. On the right, you can see, uh, this is New York Central. This is the big four main line. You can see a little yard over here. Uh, there were indus industries on both sides uh, of the uh, main line, including the rapid. So when the rapid came up uh, in New York Central up the West 98th Street curve to West 117th Street, uh, there was a siding par parallel from there all the way to West Park uh, Yard. So pretty heavy industries. Again, a lot of LCL stuff that was big back then. So here we see um, the rapid transit west side uh, airport extension under construction. They use uh, Corten for uh, catenary structures, which was Corten was like the miracle steel back then. They're actually replacing those foundations now. My dad and I, this was close to our house. So we used to go here and watch the construction. We, uh, we convinced the track guys, contractors, to actually let us drive some spikes. So we drove a few spikes and we were working on the railroad. So that's my dad on the right side. That's me when I was a kid. And the interesting thing with this extension, uh, unlike the, uh, the route along the nickel plate or the NW, where they built those big humps to get over uh, sidings, freight railroad sidings, the New York Central permitted them uh, to take their industrial site in here on the left and to actually cross over, you can see the diamonds here, uh, at grade with the CTS Rapid when it was expanded, which was kind of interesting. So the, the uh, catenary overhead was actually set up so that it could, it could raise it. There was uh, uh, motors that would actually raise the catenary up high enough for freight railroad clearances to get them across uh, this line here through these diamonds. Of course, occasionally they, the wire would go up, but it would not come back down. Uh, so they used to uh, coast through that area 
uh, until they could actually fix it. So that was kind of fun to watch. Uh, so part of the extension was the purchase of uh, new rapid transit trains. So they uh, made an order for 20 cars of Pullman Standard. This is a Pullman Standard postcard. Uh, these were, you know, fairly advanced cars for their day. Um, they were stainless steel. They had fiberglass ends, kind of like Chicago started doing with their uh, first Pullman or modern Pullman cars that they uh, that they built. So the name Airporter, these cars were called the Airporters. The name Airporter came from a contest that CTS had to, to name these cars, and that name uh, was selected. So that's where the Airporter came from. I always kind of wondered about that. Um, these were big cars. So these cars were 70 feet long, uh, almost 10 and a half feet wide. The odd thing is they had two doors per side, which uh, back when I rode it, uh, was a daily rider in the late 70s uh, when ridership was really high. It was very tough to get in and out of these cars. I don't, I don't know who thought of the two doors. The doors were also outside home rather than inside pocket doors, which in a harsh weather environment like Cleveland was pretty tough. Uh, they froze up in the wintertime. The door tracks weren't heated. Supervisors had to cover, carry uh, little rubber mallets around so they could smack the doors and break the ice loose. Uh, these cars were air conditioned. They had uh, cam control, 400 horsepower motors, 55 mile an hour top speed. And they had a rail fan seat in the front, similar to some series of Chicago's cars. Um, the interesting thing about this was this is a big rapid transit car when you think about it for its day. Uh, you know, putting commuter rail and that stuff aside, when you think about rapid transit itself, you know, Toronto had big subway cars. Uh, and that's where, where they may have gotten this idea from. Of course, Cleveland ran in a, a railroad right away, so they had a lot of width uh, to be able to run in. They weren't that constrained. Of course, they didn't have a subway, so they weren't worried about constraints of curves and subways either. Um, so um, when you think about um, the modern way of, of rapid transit, uh, lines that were built in the 70s and into the 80s, like Atlanta, Washington, Miami, Baltimore, they kind of adopted this large, you know, 70, 75 foot, 10 foot and a half wide car, kind of became the standard for U.S. modern rapid transit. So it's kind of interesting that, that Cleveland was already into that um, at that time. And back when I was a kid and I saw this, I thought, you know, these cars are way too big to ever go in the subway. I bet you the subway is just gone forever, which of course it was. Um, so the neat thing is I got to, as a kid, because my dad was, you know, so connected with the operations people and the maintenance people at CTS, even though he worked for Shaker, we got to go out and uh, test rides of these cars uh, with the engineering staff. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And it was really, they were very modern. I mean, they, uh, in the long run, they were not that well liked by the maintenance folks, particularly. They were incredibly fast. They accelerated really fast. It was like, you know, PCC car like acceleration it was pretty uh, dramatic. And they kind of looked like a spaceship to me compared to the old uh, St. Louis Bluebird. So they made quite a splash. So Cleveland was not only the first system in uh, the US to have a direct connection from downtown to their airport. But they were actually the first system in the Western Hemisphere to have that connection. So um, pretty interesting. So one of the neat things about the cars was they were actually delivered on their own wheels uh, from Pullman Standard Plant, Chicago, all the way to Cleveland. So these pictures were taken by Willis McCaleb, who was a nickel plate photographer and a good friend of my father's, an active Cleveland area rail fan. So they put adapter couplers on these uh, box cars on either end, the couple with uh, the airporters, and they moved them on their own wheels all the way to Cleveland. Here we are uh, close to the joint area. That's the Beltway Freeway Bridge above us here. And they wound up coming through the uh, Shaker Rapid uh, East 32nd Street interchange track with the nickel plate and were delivered to uh, CTS. So CTS actually got these cars uh, before the extension was open, so they put them on service on the existing line from uh, West Park 
to Windermere and they got the opportunity to kind of shake out some of the, the issues with the cars before they open up the rapid transit extension. So the other unique thing about the airport extension was they actually put cab signals in. Uh, so there was an automatic transfer when you got to uh, West Park Station from a uh, standard block signal system to cab signals. Uh, so that was kind of neat. Uh, and they retrofitted all the uh, old St. Louis 1955-58 uh, series cars with cab signals as well because uh, they continue to run uh, the Bluebirds to the airport, not just the airporters. Uh, they also put in a new uh, cons control console at the new Brook Park substation. Um, so we can see that here. And they actually had a, um, they're, they're highlighting their high speed data link uh, using uh, cards. So kind of interesting. So this is opening day. So this was a big event in 68. You can see they had uh, uh, a whole line of stewardesses, which we can't say anymore. You could say flight attendants nowadays, but they had all these pretty girls and all the uniforms lined up for opening day. And then we smashed through the banner. And then uh, this picture here was taken by Willis McCaleb. And then uh, the new service began. Um, and there was a, uh, yeah, it was a big splash. It was in the newspaper, actually in the in national, the national media and television. It was really a big deal. This was a CTS promotional brochure. This is a brochure by Republic Steel that may have provided the stainless steel. I'm not really sure. Um, uh, this was a brochure by General Electric because these cars have GE propulsion on them. Um, and actually the ERA, the rail fans, also did a, uh, an article in headlights on uh, the airporters. This was written by Bruce Benty, who I understand is still around. I think he's in North Carolina. Uh, um, I think he's on the program tonight. I think oh, great. he's watching it. Hey, Bruce. <laughs> he, uh, yeah, um, I'm just checking. Okay, he's not on now, but I know he, he was on earlier. Cause That's too bad. Yeah. I'll tell him. I see him. <laughs> yeah, so the... To answer the question, why did Albert Porter permit and not really oppose the construction of the airport extension? Because the I-71 freeway to the airport opened up prior to the CTS rapid transit expansion. So it diluted a lot of the ridership potential. He already got his freeway, so I guess he didn't really care one way or the other. Uh, there was a marginal increase in ridership. This, is, this did not... Um, cause a tremendous amount of ridership and they have gone up a thousand or two um, but it wasn't quite what was anticipated but then again the freeway was actually quite easy much easier to use than the rapid and if you were a business person or a family with a lot of kids you probably were gonna um, take a cab instead so this is a nice picture of an airporter leaving Windermere station 1971 this is a neat picture of a uh, of the uh, big four right away paralleling uh, the CTS rapid. You can faintly see a plane coming in for a landing. Up here, it's kind of a neat picture. Uh, this is a picture of airporters at West 98th Street Curve. You can see the, the old bluebirds on the right side. You can see these, uh, these vents they had in the roof. Uh, they had these vents and they had old, uh, apparently surplus World War II submarine fans in the ceiling. Uh, to cool the cars down, uh, but it also in ingested a lot of snow in the wintertime. So I remember riding these cars in the wintertime with snow actually coming in through the ventilation system of the car. So it was actually snowing on the inside of the car. Uh, they eventually made these fiberglass covers to cover the fans in the, in the wintertime, but that was pretty interesting. So they did run the cars to the airport. We see uh, a vehicle here at the Fulton Curve uh, and also a flexible bus above us. Uh, here's a neat picture of two airporters coming out of Cleveland Unit Terminal on the west side viaduct. You can see, uh, Carl, you can see this Christmas tree over here of automatic block signals, including a call on signal. And uh, it's a time signal because it has a T on it. So in, in, in terms of the rail fan seat, we can see here, we've got a couple of people sitting in the rail fan seat. The rail fan seat was great. I loved it when I was a kid to ride in that thing. It was really a blast. 
but what happened is Cleveland wound up in this uh, big rock throwing spree uh, of kids along the rapid throwing rocks, shopping carts, logs, anything they can get their hands on, on top of uh, rapid transit trains. In fact, they put screens over the windows of the uh, old bluebirds over the motorman's cab uh, to prevent rocks from getting into the windows of the old bluebirds. And unfortunately, what happened here is, is kids threw a big chunk of concrete off of a bridge. It went through this front window. There was a, a, a guy with his kid riding in the front. The concrete smashed through the window. It actually killed, those, it killed the kid and his father. And they uh, shut that off so you couldn't, they could not, an operator could not operate without that cab door configuration closed. They put bars across this window and eventually they put some luggage racks here to keep people out of the area. Um, so Cleveland was known for its intermodal connections. We talked about how well they integrated their bus service. Um, that served them very well. Um, until there was such a hue and cry from people who used to have one seat rides uh, having to transfer and then paying the upcharge because it was an express service. They slowly started running more duplicate service along some of these city lines and started diluting to some degree the uh, ridership on the, on the rapid. So now we're getting into the, uh, and here's kind of like the final state, airport to Windermere. This is a timetable from 69. This Brook Park station here um, connected to I-71 and eventually to 480. So people, there were some good ridership from people coming off the freeway from Western suburbs going into Brook Park station because the freeway connection was so good. It was also probably the best station to get your car stolen because the freeway access was so good. Uh, you could uh, steal a car and get out of there pronto without the police uh, chasing you. So that was uh, not the best place. So now we're into the UMTA era, 1964 UMTA was created. Uh, they pushed a lot of these uh, regions to uh, create a 10 year plans. Um, by, by about 73, 74 in the seventies, most of these big top 10 cities had already created regional transit authorities. Cleveland had not at that point, but they were still eligible to receive uh, federal funds. So they did apply for a grant uh, which they got in 69, and they used the money to to build the um, campus station, which we'll talk about here, and then also to build the new Brook Park Yard, which was very close to the airport. So they had a maintenance facility and storage yard at Brook Park, and of course they had the old Windermere Yard that was opened in 1955 with the original one, which was actually a very small, compact uh, shop. In fact, the um, there were elevators to bring the uh, trucks down from the first floor of the truck rebuild shop in the basement of the building. It was such a compact building. Uh, in fact, at MARTA, MARTA is probably the only other system I've seen that's got an elevator just for bringing trucks up and down for rebuilds. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. So they, they received a $13 million grant. So one of the ideas was to build this East 34th Street campus station. So prior to 1971, Shaker always had a stop here. This is one of their standard green wood shelters, um, but you can see a nice four car train. This was the longest train of airporters. Uh, the Bluebirds were six car trains, the airporters were four car trains. This was the longest airporter train, but they didn't stop here. So again, this is left hand running. You're seeing the rear of the train. That's why you see the red marker lights and then it's actually going eastbound on the left hand side. Um, so the idea was that people particularly from Shaker uh, they were trying to go to the airport uh, as well as other bus lines would have to uh, go to the terminal, uh, get off, go up the ramps, transfer to the airport rapid. Uh, and so this would be a quick, easy way to transfer people that were trying to go to uh, the airport or other locations on the west side rapid, primarily the airport. And so they built a new station here. And also at the time, uh, Cuyahoga Community College built a campus that was just outside downtown, which was hard for um, CTS to serve. So they created a new loop bus route. And then of course, Cleveland State University uh, uh, was on East 22nd Street, which is also kind of harder for that, for CTS to serve with bus service. So the idea was students will come over here, they would extend loop bus service, 
and people wanting to transfer from off of Shaker to the Rapid to go to the airport, this would be a great location. So they had a big advertising campaigns. It was a big deal. And here you can see the new, uh, this is the new high level platform. Here's an airport, this is 1971. So this is not long after it opened. Um, it was a great idea, but it wasn't the greatest neighborhood. So uh, uh, you were kind of standing out here with your luggage in the middle of friggin' nowhere uh, and you became a target. And so there was a lot of, a lot of criminal activity uh, that occurred at the station. There wasn't a big enough police presence to deter it. Uh, even the cashiers didn't like working at the station because they were getting robbed all the time. Um, so it was a great idea. It didn't work out too well. It was, was not uh, executed really well. They've actually rebuilt the station recently, totally rebuilt it, so it's still in operation. So they let Cleveland State University and Tri-C, uh, they let students design and paint buses in celebration of the station and the new loop bus extension over to uh, the campus station. Uh, another thing that's kind of interesting with Cleveland, a lot of people don't know, is they had the first AC propulsion uh, cars. So they uh, took three uh, airporters and converted them to uh, AC propulsion. It was a, a project, um, kind of a joint project, um, with Reliant Electric, which was a uh, uh, local manufacturer of motors, AC motors, and uh, GE. So they did three cars. They tested them. They remained in service. They ran well. They, they, they uh, as far as I know, stayed converted to AC propulsion their entire time. They did train line with uh, other non-AC propulsion cars because I've seen photographs of the train line. So I assume they stayed in their AC propulsion state for the rest of their lives. You can kind of see the bars across the windows here where the rail fan seat is and some luggage area in here. Here's a shaker train going into the shop tunnel over here. So they, uh, it was actually Westinghouse project. I'm looking at the slide here, so uh, joint project. So it was pretty advanced for its day. Uh, the state of the art car also visited Cleveland. This is back in 1975. So just at the advent of, um, of RTA, um, folks probably re remember this. This was uh, a project where uh, it was run by uh, the DOT, uh, by UMTA. Uh, they were looking to highlight modern modern cars, modern propulsion. It, the cars were built by St. Louis. They were based on a, a New York R44 car. They gave the project management uh, to Boeing to actually manage the project of testing the cars. They had solid state chopper control, which is a big deal at the time. They did, a, they did a couple of different interior configurations. There was a, one for high density, one for low density. It was a Mary Pair car. Um, they had a huge accident over at the Pueblo Test Center where they actually collided with a freight train, with a freight car sitting on the siding. The switch was open and uh, they killed the operator of the train. So that was kind of a sad event. They ran in Cleveland for three days. Um, it was around for a couple of weeks. There was a mock-up that was also displayed at a couple of malls in a public square. Cleveland was the only system that actually used a pantograph operation to run. So these cars ran Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, New York, Philadelphia, and eventually uh, Patco. And they're actually, uh, they reside at, uh, up in uh, Kennebuckport. So these are some illustrations of the SOAC car. This is a nice rendering. And I actually found this picture. I, I was looking all over the place. I, I know that I took some when I was a kid. I couldn't find them. I didn't know what I did with them. And I, I was desperately searching for a picture of the SOAC car on Cleveland, at Cleveland. So here's a picture of the SOAC car, Windermere Yard, 1975, taken by this gentleman, uh, Mr. Barnes. You can see uh, St. Louis Bluebird car to the left. So I actually found a picture. So I was pretty happy I found this. So now we go on to Shaker Heights and what was going on in Shaker Heights in 55 to 75. Uh, of course, there was the uh, City of Shaker Heights 50th year celebration. They painted this car a special gold paint job in 1961. Uh, a big character back in the Shaker days uh, was Bob Landgraf. 
he was part of that uh, Shaker Lakes advocacy group that protested kind of against the, um, the Heights Freeway. Um, he got the attention of Mayor, Mayor Jones. Um, he liked him quite a bit. He asked him to come over to work on Shaker when Jones was running Shaker. He's a civil engineer. He eventually became general manager when Paul Jones left as a mayor. He was kind of an unusual guy, kind of awkward and gangly, but very intelligent guy. Uh, he did come over to RTA when RTA was created. Um, his heart was always in the right place. He was a, he was a very professional guy. He was very nice to me when I was a kid, very nice to me when I was in college. Uh, he did hire Ed Allen, those, those people who may know who Ed Allen was. Ed Allen ran the shop. Um, he was uh, recommended by Gerald Brookins from Trolleyville. Ed was uh, of Iowa fame, working on the old, uh, I guess, Iowa traction. Um, so here's your typical shaker, you know, lash up uh, multiple unit PCC car trains, um, uh, M Ewing uh, 600 volts. That's why you don't see all the trolley pulls up because they actually train lined uh, 600 volt power between the cars. You see a mix here of Minneapolis and Pullman standard cars, everything that they ran, everything that they owned train lined. Um, the Pullman's and Minneapolis cars train line really well together. If you put a St. Louis from St. Louis in the mix, Oh, they ran okay, but there was a lot of kind of bucking back and forth, and not, not the best operation. But in 59, believe it or not, um, they were still running these 1914-15 Kuhlman uh, center entrance cars in service. 59 was the last year for um, regular scheduled service. Uh, my dad ran these in revenue service as an operator. Um, and they still kept two, they kept two five car trains that they ran until the early 60s for special events, baseball games, football games, big, big, uh, big events. Uh, 60, 61, they were still running them for special service. Uh, they also had um, uh, several of these cars. These are the old Chicago Ron Elgin, um, uh, St. Louis cars. Um, and they were still in operation when the rapid transit started in 55. Uh, there was a special agreement um, from CTS to not use these cars any longer. These cars are mostly used in off-peak service, so they still ran some, uh, some trippers during rush hour with these cars. Uh, they were comfortable to ride, and a lot of people did like them. The problem with these cars was they were very slow. They got in the way of the rapid transit cars, and they were actually slower than the 1,200 cars. 1200 series center entrance cars. Uh, and they were, it was very difficult apparently to modify the trucks to put the strip trip stops on for the automatic block signal system that was in the joint area. So there was an agreement to quit running these. Uh, and my dad told me there was actually some um, money that changed hands where CTS paid for, I think two or three PCC cars to help replace these and all the 1200s out of service. So the cars they purchased were these 1946 cars from St. Louis. Uh, they were built by St. Louis. They were acquired in 1959. That's when the 1200s were retired. The 300 series cars quit running. Um, and these cars were actually, uh, they were repainted and, and uh, uh, reconfigured for MGO operation in St. Louis shops. They were uh, very capable. Uh, as a lot of these big systems, their shops were incredibly capable. So. Um, these cars entered service and stayed in service for, for quite a few years, although they were not the most uh, well-liked uh, cars, particularly. Um, so some fan trips. This is a fan trip with car 12. Um, there was a, a group of folks, including my dad, who um, went to then Mayor Paul Jones. He used to be a charger shaker years ago. There was a group of uh, Shaker Motormen that were rail fans, Don Bolt, Bob Blatt, my dad. And they went to talk to the mayor and to ask him if they, if he would keep uh, one of the center entrance cars for um, charter service. And so he decided uh, that, that he was good with that. I'm not sure where they picked car 12 other than it may have been in good shape. Um, so they actually uh, repainted it. The Akron Railroad Club um, actually repainted the car. Oh, excuse me, the Euclid Rail Fans Club repainted the car under the terminal. 
Um, they let him repaint the car under the terminal. They obviously didn't use a paint booth. Um, my dad actually did the striping that was his <clears> job <throat> to tape and paint the stripes in the car. Um, and then the car was used uh, for many, many years in, in on excursion service. Um, that's my dad actually running the car. Rich, so yeah. I had the, the pleasure of riding in that car with the Northern Ohio Railway Museum in the 80s. But I did have a question I've sort of put off asking. Did a uh, question from Randy Litz is, did CTS or Shaker either run all service ever or do they run now or did they always shut down overnight? Never, never ran all service. Neither system. No, they did run pretty late though. Okay. And, and pretty early in the morning because my dad took it to work every day. And he used to leave the house like around four o'clock or so. So, huh. so they, um, they could have easily done it, but they did. Uh, here's a picture of the interior of uh, 12. You can see the rattan seats. And these, these fan trips were just a tremendous amount of fun. And they went on for years. They ran in the wintertime, ran in the fall, summertime. Uh, they took the cars out onto the CTS Rapid. Uh, we'll see some pictures of that. And they had a differential dump fan trip. I'm not sure this, if this is the same fan trip. They may have gone from uh, some CTS Rapid over to Shaker or started on Shaker. Um, and here's a picture of uh, car 12. This is at Windermere Shop. Windermere Shop on uh, CTS Rapid had a loop to turn cars so they could run uh, the 1200 uh, or, or PCC cars. They actually ran PCC cars out here too on fan trips. And they could actually turn them on the loop and then get them back to Shaker. So that was kind of fun to ride on those fan trips. On the maintenance side, uh, Shaker ran everything on a shoestring budget. Uh, you know, secondhand rail, you know, used uh, whatever they could get their hands on. Uh, they didn't spend a tremendous amount of money on maintenance, but the system was in fairly good repair. It, it didn't deteriorate to, uh, say, like a Pittsburgh level before they rebuilt. But, but uh, they they had no radios. Uh, they used uh, wayside phones. You can see this guy over here is actually leaning on a wayside phone cabinet. Those were at crossovers. Um, the phones were crank phones with dry cell batteries. Uh, they didn't work half the time, which is kind of, kind of tough. But here you see they were, what's called the ox. They called the ox uh, because it worked like an ox. That's how it got the nickname. And so they numbered it OX, the ox. Uh, this was an ex Coleman, 1924 Coleman, ex Eastern Michigan, ex Northern Ohio. It arrived at Kingsbury Shop on Shaker Rapid under its own power in 1932 from the Northern Ohio. Um, my dad always said that um, Shaker acquired it. It kind of wound up there. Uh, that it was brought there. They didn't actually pay anything for it. It was just kind of left left there. That was his story. Um, they used to store it in the shop tunnels for years. Um, they used to use it for the Santa Claus special. Where they used to take Santa Claus up to Shaker Square every year. That was kind of a big deal. My dad used to do that. He used to like doing that. Um, I spent a lot of nights on this with my dad. It was a lot of fun going out with the work guys. Um, it was acquired in 1985 by Trolleyville, moved by uh, moved over to Trolleyville. Ex Tim Tim O'Donnell, Mark Brookins, and I rode on the on the car on the ox leaving the, the terminal out to Kingsbury shop. This is the same work train, single tracking around. They were doing uh, putting new ties and doing some balanced work. Uh, and like I talked before, the the uh, Cleveland Railway work equipment, which was which became CTS and Shaker actually acquired some work equipment off of uh, CTS when they were closing the streetcar system down. They they were all set up to be MU and they were all HL controlled. They even had trailers, control trailers that they ran between these cars, where they could train line um, trailer trailer dumps and then power dumps, um, which is kind of kind of interesting, kind of unique. So the 1200s were also HL control. So they could actually MU the differential dumps and the 1200s and run them together in uh, work train service. I think this is car 27. And you can see we're into the orange, the orange era. Um, so they had some pretty phenomenal uh, accidents. So they, they uh, tore down a bunch of poles. These poles were original to the system, like, you know, 19, 29, 30, 
uh, in that era. There were a couple times when polls came down like this. This was probably the worst time because they had a five-day outage, which is the longest in Shaker's history. So the big deal on Shaker back then was they went to the orange, excuse me for the dog working, the orange uh, paint scheme, which was kind of controversial with a lot of folks. My dad took this picture. This was in the old Traction and Models magazine, if you remember Bain Jones and Traction Models. Uh, so this was their version of the Traction Orange paint scheme. Here's one in Revenue Service at Linfield Station. This is on the Van Aken line to get it towards the terminal. Some major Shaker Heights news of the period. Uh, they were they were ready and prepared for the Huff riot. Uh, they had the National Guard here and the police. And I guess they were somehow thinking that rioters would walk up from Cleveland into Shaker and cause all kinds of problems. It's kind of hard to believe that, but I think a lot of people were very scared at the time because they had never seen anything like that. So they were worried about it. Uh, so everybody was ready to defend themselves. Uh, and then the courthouse, their courthouse and police station was blown up in 1970. That was a, a major news event. Uh, they thought it was some kind of a, a terrorist or some some rioter or some militant or whatever, but it turned out to be a, a, a guy who had some serious psychological issues that was receiving treatment and was arrested by the Shaker Heights Police Department. So he kind of held a grudge on them and decided to blow him, himself and the courthouse up. You can only imagine how big the bomb was to destroy the whole friggin' building. It's kind of amazing. Um, so now we go to the new, new beginning, and this is an orange slide because RTA was kind of the orange paint color, so that's why I picked the orange slide. So the route to RTA really came through Mayor Ralph Perk. Uh, Perk was the mayor that succeeded um, Stokes. He was another kind of product of Cleveland. He grew up in. Uh, uh, kind of poor working class uh, uh, ethnic neighborhood called Slavic Village. He was a Czech origin. And of course, being, you know, Czech, Slovak, Hungarian, uh, that was a big plus in Cleveland politics at the time because it was a huge population of folks. Uh, they were uh, first and second generation um, Americans. Um, he spent 10 years on city council. Um, he, uh, was elected mayor in 72. Um, he was the first Republican mayor elected in Cleveland since the 1940s. So he's a, he was a very well, very well liked guy. Uh, he was like a very down to earth guy. Uh, he was famous for saying like awkward, like stupid comments at times, you know, <laughs> like some politicians. He did, he did kind of silly things, but. Um, he famously set his hair on fire, which is the uh, image down here on the right side. Those are actually flames on top of his head. He was opening up a convention using a, uh, a blowtorch to cut a piece of metal to open up a convention. He and Stokes were actually good friends. Uh, they did like each other, had respect for each other because they were. he was on city council for Perk was for so many years. Um, again, he was a real per personable guy. I met him when I was in college. I was down drinking in a bar in the flats downtown, he came in after some uh, meeting he was at. We called him over to the table. He sat down with us. He had a drink with us. Uh, his police detail was there with us. Uh, we went outside uh, and you could actually dock your boat out there. And there was a guy in a power boat out there. Uh, he invited the mayor to take a ride. And uh, the mayor jumped down the boat with his drink in the hand. And, and uh, he told the police detail to stay behind. And uh, and get a couple of beers and he'd be back. So he was he was just a just a really down to earth person. But he was very well liked. But he was very passionate about transit, uh, and he realized how important about the vitality of transit was to the city of Cleveland. And and, and at the time, CTS was really hurting. Uh, ridership was declining. Uh, fares were increasing service was being cut and they got into this spiral that a lot of transit systems did in the 70s where you know you you raise fares to cover costs you cut service then ridership dropped and you had to raise fares go through the whole cycle again and you got in this death spiral and it got to the point where where uh, uh, cts no longer could cover their expenses so they were covering breaking even out of the fare box 
until this 1973, 1974 period. So they were able to pay back their bonds on rapid transit construction, they were able to operate the system from the fare box. They were one of the last big 10 operators. They were able to continue to do that. However, it kind of hit the fan in uh, 74 and, and uh, uh, Mayor Perk uh, bailed out uh, Cleveland Transit with this uh, uh, $9.6 million loan because they were getting ready to default on their bonds. He knew how critical things were uh, for, for the transit and how important they were. Shaker actually lost $400,000 that same year. They had to make it up through a general fund. So he knew that something had to be done. The, the pattern of creating these regional transit authorities was already out there. UMTA was very supportive of it. And he knew that they, it just could not survive uh, out of the fare box the way it was doing. And we couldn't let it decline any further. And so he really had his sights on moving towards uh, a regional transit system. So he was in large part uh, behind the creation of RTA. These are some of the collateral materials from the day uh, in the run up to the election. And of course the big deal was they were gonna drop the fare down to 25 cents for local, 35 cents for express, which express fares were actually up to a dollar uh, back then at the time. So it was, it was a huge reduction in fare. They were gonna increase service. They were gonna provide free rides for elderly and handicapped folks for most of the day, uh, half fare for students. And one of the things that he emphasized was that you know Cleveland was leaving a lot of money on the table in federal funds uh, because they didn't have a regional transit system. They didn't have a system with taxing authority. They weren't uh, properly aligned to receive uh, federal funds. And they used Atlanta as an example, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, where they had received $800 million for transit expansion and Cleveland had left $150 million on the table at the same time. So um, part of uh, the run up to the uh, uh, creation of the regional transit authority, one of the things that the feds were pushing at the time uh, was they wanted to see a 10 year plan from, from transit agencies because I think they wanted to gauge the kind of funding that would be uh, available to uh, really get into the transit business and the fund. At the time, they were funding operations as well as capital expansion back in the good old days of federal funding. And so Cleveland, uh, the uh, general manager at the time, uh, Paul, Bob Pollock was a general manager at the time. He was tasked with putting together a 10-year plan and the, and the rail component included the downtown subway, of course, that uh, reared its head again. Uh, West Side Rapid Transit extensions to I-90 West to Clay Grove. We'll talk about that and then an extension to Berea. And then East Side extensions to Euclid Heights Boulevard. And then on the Shaker side, uh, uh, a, a very nice, simple, they already owned the right of way, uh, about a two mile extension to I-271. So they'd be freeway ramps and a big parking lot and a, and a nice direct quick ride into downtown. And then a short extension from Warrensville Road to Randall Park Mall. So that was the 10 year plan. Uh, none of that actually happened. Unfortunately, a lot of that was due to opposition, um, local political opposition, and also the creation of RTA. There were restrictions on what rapid transit extension plans could be implemented. And our buddy, Norm Crumhouse, the planner of the city of Cleveland was very opposed to any of these rapid transit expansions was influential in the contract between CTS and RTA to create RTA and for, RTA and for CTS to be transferred to the new organization. And there were a lot of restrictions put in on rapid transit expansion, which is really sad because that's when federal funding was really at its peak back in these back in the 70s, early 80s. Uh, and Cleveland just didn't, didn't take advantage of um, extensions, so although they did, they did rebuild a lot of what they had, uh, but they didn't really build anything New, so they kind of missed that whole um, that whole era. Sadly, um, there was one last battle uh, for rapid transit expansion. This was Porter. I call this Albert Porter's last stand, and this goes back to the I ninety freeway, which is the one that cut, cut through my neighborhood. Uh, the I ninety freeway. This is a picture of a train approaching Triscuit Station. This is a Triscuit garage on the left. The I-90 freeway would kind of kind of come across the top here where this bridge is. In fact, if you ride 
I-99, you look down, you can see Triska Garage. And so the idea was to build a simple uh, elevated junction flyover from the from the, the line that's running here today, drop down to the center median of the freeway, and then go out to the western suburbs, at least the Clay Road initially, uh, kind of Chicago style in the middle of, of a freeway expansion. Made a lot of sense, was very reasonable. So the uh, the rapid uh, the rapid transit, the line to uh, Hopkins Airport is not shown here, but it's generally kind of in this area here. So uh, they would have come off the existing rapid, like you saw in that picture, they would have dropped into the center of 90 and they would have went out west. So there was a lot of opposition to this from, from the state perspective, of course, from Albert Porter's County perspective. So they actually built a section of the freeway here through the Lakewood area where I grew up uh, without the center median. So there was no center median to put rapid transit in. Uh, there was a lawsuit, construction of the freeway shut down for a number of years. Uh, the, they prevailed in the lawsuit, lawsuit. So if you go to the west of Lakewood, there's a center median re reservation. And if you go to the east of Lakewood, there's a center reservation in the free for rapid transit. In the critical area where you needed to connect to the rapid, there was no median. Um, so they, uh, they had their way anyway, even though the lawsuit prevailed. Uh, it was almost impossible to build the extension. So uh, a new era is arriving. And Shaker's going to be gone. And CTS is going to be gone. These are some pictures in the 70s before RTA took over. So a whole new era uh, was about to begin. So this is kind of the end of the pre-RTA era uh, presentation. But uh, as a bonus, as an added bonus, since you guys are here, um, there was a last ditch attempt to provide a downtown circulator in Cleveland, and that was part of the downtown people mover program of UMTA, where they had $220 million for proof of concept for a downtown people mover. And there were five cities that were selected. And of course, Detroit was the only one that actually ever got built. Uh, Miami was successful, wasn't part of the original program. Um, so Cleveland won $41 million grant to build this downtown people mover loop. Uh, it was opposed by uh, our buddy Norm Krumholtz, the city planner, and a lot of other folks in the press and the media, um, Cleveland Press, brain, brain dealer, they just didn't see the benefit of it. It actually made a lot of sense, but a lot of the opposition was because Cleveland has a lot of very nice historical buildings. Have you ever been to Cleveland? It was a thought that they would just really kind of deface the city uh, by, by imposing this modern, you know, infrastructure. These kind of look like Westinghouse people over cars over here. Uh, I don't know what, who did this rendering, but anyway, um, it was eventually killed by the boy mayor. We used to call him the boy mayor. He was the youngest mayor of any top ten city in the U.S. Dennis Kucinich. So uh, he was the guy who finally killed it. And as another added bonus, uh, CAR 109, which is at the Northern Ohio Rail Museum, just got back into operation here recently within the last couple months. So that's a picture here on the right. This car was restored by RTA. Uh, my friend Tim O'Donnell was in charge of the restoration for RTA. He researched the original colors and decals and everything and got all the body work done and got the thing back up and running. Uh, Roundtober was the CEO of the town. He was very supportive. And here's a picture Bill Vigers took of the same car at Windermere Station with a subway destination sign. So the subway that never happened. This is the only picture I've ever seen of a subway sign on a uh, Cleveland Rapid Transit car. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. Okay, can you unshare, um, Rich? See, we'll put everybody back to gallery so we can. Very good. So, uh, Rich, why don't you turn your video on and everybody else? Uh, uh, everyone else is free to unmute. And turn on. Okay. okay. 
There we go. So, Rich, I want to thank you very much, especially on short notice. This was an outstanding program. Usually I step away multiple times. I didn't. I stepped away once and I regret it. It was an excellent program. Uh, so for anybody leaving early here, the next program is May 19th. It will be Ray DeGroote doing a survey of a lot of uh, 1950s, 1960s, unusual operations, including uh, Canada. Rich, you have a few minutes just for some questions? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Uh, oh, no. All right, so I'm going to, one comment I want to read to you, which I thought was so well done. I don't know if, Will Cows, are you still on here? No, he left. But I think it typifies what I think many people thought of your presentation, Rich. He said, I really enjoy these historical, quote, deep dives into a city's rapid transit system history and the associated decisions of the time by someone with fundamental knowledge of all the nuances. The level of detail and insight is fascinating along with the fantastic accompanying pictures. Bravo and many thanks. I think that- oh, very nice. I, I think uh, um, many people without saying it so eloquently said that. I also made note of a lot of transit professionals on. So Bruce Benty was on earlier, Carl Jackson still on with us. John Schumann was on and uh, Paul O'Brien. So I think a lot of people that, and did I mention? Yes, yeah, said John Schumann. Now, some of them have sort of signed off for the night, but, uh, and Peter Strauss, who I see right now uh, on video. So I have to say, this is probably one of the highest proportion of transit, uh, longtime transit professionals, and Mike Glicken, of course. Uh, uh, myself, you should. We did record. You should, when you have a chance, read the comments that people are uh, posting right now. There were two questions I didn't have a chance to ask you. Then I'll open it up to everyone. Uh, one person asked if Cleveland Rail or bus ever went through the hard plastic seat era, or oh yeah, posted, because now it looks like uh, our, um, under RTA uh, cushion seats seem to be making a comeback. Yeah, there was a, a, a group of buses that was purchased. In fact, I had a, one of the pictures I put up. I don't see you on here. There was a, there was a purchase. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, anyway, they did, they did run seats, okay. uh, buses with plastic seats, which were not very popular. And they spun them off uh, in the later years uh, when I was a bus hostler. Uh, they uh, they put them in school tripper surface because school kids love to cut up seats on buses, and so they put the seats with the, the buses with the plastic seats on the school trippers because they couldn't they couldn't damage it too much. <laughs> That's how they ended their life. But they were not well received by the average rider. Go ahead and uh, there we go. Hi, hey, Rich. Go. Thank you. Uh, I learned so much uh, about Cleveland and um, um, its history, and uh, certainly about CTS. Uh, growing up, I was a big fan about reading about Shaker Heights Rapid, and certainly just the fact that uh, they were able to MU uh, PCC cars, yeah. and um, just in general. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was just terrific. Oh, thank you. Glad you liked it. Uh, as an observation, I seem to recall reading that uh, the first rapid transit cars in Cleveland, although they had PCC technology, the uh, system refused to pay the, the uh, conference committee uh, the royalties they were supposed to get. Oh, is that right? Yeah, no, no, a number of systems did that, so. Yeah, they ran the wheels off of those things, that's for sure. The uh, the airporters, when they bought the uh, Tokyo cars, 
84 or so. They, uh, Tokyo made a deal with them to replace the entire fleet. They, they were intended to run a mixed fleet of airporters and Tokyo uh, cars, but Tokyo gave them a great offer. They went back to the, uh, to the FTA at the time and the FTA permitted them to keep the airporters as a reserve fleet. So they, sent their, they sat there at Central Rail for years working off their, um, their 30 year life cycle federal requirement. Um, they just never, they were uh, difficult to maintain. The airporters were not well liked by the maintenance guys. The operators liked because they were super fast cars. They were, they really moved. They accelerated very quickly. But the maintenance guys kind of hated. They didn't have a, a really great reliability. Um, so they were happy to see him parked. I also uh, mentioned something on the uh, in the chat box. Uh, made mention of that uh, Cleveland was the only place the state of the art car ran under the pantograph. That's right. Yeah. But the state of the art car ran in Chicago on of all places the Skokie oh, Swift. Swift. Yeah, that's right. They had to build a they had to build a, a retrievable platform extension for it because it was wider than the uh, CTA cars. But at that time, Skokie Swift used overhead. So uh, yeah, obviously. Yeah, so it had to be. Yeah, you're right. They have to use it. So what I what I uh, what I read in my research was incorrect. Yeah, as one of their instructors showed me the platform extension at Howard, they they had to retrieve it the, when a state of the art car came in, and they had to drop it down when one of the regular CTA cars huh. came in. That's funny. You learn you learn something every new every time you do stuff like this. It's amazing the stuff that comes up. But that makes that makes a lot of sense. I know they uh, Paco wound up with them for a while, and uh, I remember talking to Bob Korak about it when he was a guy. They were hoping to use the cars in regular service on a routine basis, and it was just kind of a disaster. So they just gave up on them. The thing with using it on Skokie Swift was because it only involved having to modify two stations, <laughs> uh, Dempster and. Uh, Actually, it came into Howard uniquely, the way I understand it, instead of coming in on the southbound track and relaying south of the station, it wrong railed into the northbound platform at Howard. So there was just a short section that had to be uh, dropped down to accommodate it. Does anybody remember the SOAC in New York City, running in New York City or on the Broad Street subway in Philly? Yeah, I remember in uh, riding it in. Uh... Philadelphia on the Broad Street. Uh, I remember it always made a screeching sound when it came <laughs> around that curve into City Hall. I rode it on, I actually rode the, rode the cab on it on the Brighton line when I was assigned to the command center uh, the year that it ran. And for those of you who uh, aren't aware of it, it had an interesting type of speed control. It had this, the same single slide controller handle like an R44, but if you wanted to put it on sort of a wayside regulated system, what you would do, there was a row of buttons on the top of the console and you'd press the button for the speed you wanted to go and you could put the uh, power controller all the way to the maximum. It would only go as fast as you selected it for. Uh, that's neat. It looked like an old old style jukebox buttons. Yeah, as I remember the first uh, ERA activity I participated in after my dad died was uh, was in uh, Cleveland uh, on the RTA, and there was uh, some of the original original rapid transit cars have been restored and we chartered one for the day. And uh, there was like 1997 or 99 in there. Yeah, that was probably, uh, you probably wrote on 109. I think that's correct. You may have, yeah, they, for some reason, they, they only kept uh, singles. They scrapped the married pairs. They kept a group of single cars. Um, the, the maintenance guys uh, told me that the single the singles for some reason were better running better running cars 
easier, easier to maintain for some reason. They like them better than married pairs. So they they were going to use some of them for work cars. In fact, they made a 109 was actually a garbage train. And they painted it an RTA paint uh, scheme, orange and white and red. And they decided it was kind of a hassle to use it. And that became the car that they uh, restored the car to the original paint and decals and everything. So, yeah, they hung around the property for a long time. There was a group of center engines 1200s that were in work car service. Uh, they were there through the 80s. They were still used uh, for line cars and wrecker cars. Uh, kind of amazing how durable some of that equipment is. And they were, you know, those 1200s were 50 years old when they were still running and revenue service. And it's un unbelievable, you know. Yeah, I remember it was a hot summer day and we rode that RTA car uh, with the end doors open. Yeah. <laughs> I remember riding one time in Cleveland. We stopped there for a few hours on the way to elsewhere in Ohio. I rode the Shaker Heights line. It happened to be the time when they were borrowing a couple of Illinois terminal PCCs. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, I was uh, hesitant to put that in the presentation because that actually occurred. That was when RTA was already yeah. around. I, I wanted to avoid getting into the RTA um, period. That was a crazy period of time. I was an intern with the RTA when it was, it was only a couple of years old at the time. And, uh, you know, when RTA was created, there were still eight independent bus operations in the Cleveland area. And they had to, they had to, you know, um, redo all their service planning, all the, you know, uh, uh, union contracts, merging everybody together, the maintenance, the, you know, on, on the bus side was probably more complicated, than, you know, than it was on the rail side. And um, it was just a crazy period to work at RTA. Most of the, most of the CTS management hung in there for quite a while, kind of provided the core of the you know executive team for quite a few years. Uh, it was an interesting period to be to be around. First time I was in Cleveland was in 1960. And I rode the Shaker Heights line then also. It's the only time I ever saw a five car train of PC. Yeah. yeah, they used to run five car trains. They used to uh, Run, they used to run a five car shop train from uh, Kingsburg to downtown every day during the week. That's kind of a neat, neat, uh, neat thing to watch. Towards the end there, they had so many different paint jobs of the Schaefer cars. It was, it was like this rainbow of colors, you know? Um, they were like no two cars that were like the same paint job. You had the original yellows, you had orange, you had white and orange, you had all these variations of paint jobs was kind of crazy. Yeah, when RTA was created, uh, a ridership ridership went up about twenty three percent. I think it was a phenomenal increase in ridership, um, and it stayed that way for quite a few years. It really, I think the lowering the fare and increasing the service, particularly on the bus, on the bus, on bus routes, uh, it just attracted a lot of ridership. It was very successful for quite a few years to the, to the point where they just, uh, they didn't have enough equipment. They had, um, they had a couple hundred buses. They, they were basically in the scrap line. Uh, they were getting ready to get rid of them. Uh, and the ridership increased so much on the bus side, they had to uh, run those buses through the shop, rehab, and put them back out of service. So you saw you some you saw some equipment floating around out there that was not in the best shape, but they were dragging out everything they had uh, because the ridership just took off. It was it was really an amazing period. It was quite successful there for a while. Hi, everyone. When I was in Cleveland for one day, I stayed in La Quinta Hotel. Oh, we can't hear you. Okay. So when I stayed in Cleveland, 
for one day I was in Lakvinta Hotel. It's next to train station Puritas. And I see it has unusual structure. It has middle track, has something like crossing, not like diamond, and has middle track. Is it middle track used for storing trains? Oh, which station is this at? Puritas next to Lakvinta Hotel. Puritas. Oh, Puritas Station? Yes, Puritas. Yeah, Puritas has a, uh, a center tail track. And that was used to turn back trains. So they didn't run everything through the day airport. So during the rush hour, they would turn back trains at, at uh, Puritas because there was a big drop off in ridership from there into the airport. So there was no, there was no sense in it. Uh, and running all that equipment to the airport. Okay. They used to um, turn back trains at, uh, they used to run, well, they actually used to run out of the center track. Now there was a center track downtown uh, okay. with platforms on both sides. Uh, and in rush hour, they used to run trains out of the center track. Those were typically turn back trains that were going to Purity Station. But uh, it was big time ridership. It wasn't West Side heavier than East Side for a while? In terms yeah, of it, it was. It was for most of the time, which is which really, I guess, uh, a lot of the planners didn't think that was going to be the case. My dad always said that they really underestimated West Side ridership. A lot of that was because of, of uh, Lakewood had a heavy Lakewood had really heavy transit ridership. They had. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I had access. I mean, I had access to twenty-four hour bus service when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a bus line that I could walk to that was like five houses away from mine. Another one that was two blocks away from me, and another one that was three blocks away from me. Uh, the 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 transit ridership uh, uh, on the Clifton line, which is now the Cleveland State uh, BRT line, mm -hmm. uh, was super heavy. I mean, just actually the, the Clifton line and the Euclid line had such heavy ridership. They were still profitable lines uh, back in the late 70s when I was a traffic chief. They were actually making money on those lines. The ridership was so high. Clifton is a west side line? Yeah, it runs along the lake through Lakewood. Oh, okay, on the north. Uh, it used to be, uh, it used to be okay. a streetcar line. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, it was a heavy streetcar line. It ran in the... Uh, kind of in the lawn, in the front lawn of these of these houses in this neighborhood down on Clifton Avenue. It had its own private money. It didn't run in the center of the street. So when the trolley bus routes were discontinued, you were saying that the, uh, the headways were still very tight. Were they running? How yeah, free? the ridership was still very running? good. Yeah, so I, I don't know why. You know, I guess, you know, back then, the in these big cities, it was like, get the wires down. Yeah. You know, Chicago was kind of the same way. Chicago was later. They mm -hmm. went out in the seventies, but you know, the, the Chicago equipment was a lot older than Cleveland's equipment. The average age was a lot older, but those lines were heavy ridership lines, you know, but it was just, uh, you know, there may have been some commitment to city council or to the mayor or whatever that right. we're just getting rid of wire, you know, we're not doing the same. Is there a part three of your presentation coming up in the future from 1975 on? Uh, I've been asked that, but uh, it's my less, it's my least favorite era. <laughs> <laughs> oh, except now I was in Cleveland last year. They do seem to be doing two interesting things. They do have a basic, at least nowadays, quote unquote, high frequency network. They're putting it, they have a base bus network back and I think rail wise aren't they replacing the equipment with one type of equipment for both yeah they just they just announced here a short while ago uh, like a, like within days you know uh, uh, that they're uh, they're ordering cars from Siemens mm -hmm. and they're gonna they're gonna be both high platform and low platform uh, I thought they were gonna base them on the s70 that they did for muni because muni's cars you know go in market street subway or Mm -hmm. or high and low platform, but apparently uh, Cleveland's, Cleveland's platforms are higher than Muni's platforms. They're more at the level of like Calgary platforms. Calgary platforms are pretty high. Mm. I'm sure you've been to Calgary. Mm -hmm. but uh, those, are, those, are, those are pretty high platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're using the Calgary car, which is the old, what they call S200 or something, Siemens car that's been around like forever. 
Mm -hmm. um, they've they've uh, they've made it look nicer and more attractive for Calgary uh, years ago. Calgary still buys that car. Mm -hmm. So it's some version of that car. So it's not the S70. I thought it was going to be at the S70 platinum. But, but it's a light rail or it's a Stadtbahn type car, I guess. Yeah, so it's got both high, high level loading and low platform, kind of like the Pittsburgh uh, cars do, where you can run both high and low. Um, so the, the first cars they're, they're going to be buying are going to be running on heavy rail, on the CTS rail. Mm -hmm. uh, because those cars apparently, even though those cars are newer than the Breda cars, they've got serious truck bolster issues with those cars. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they, they, there's some corrosion. There's some dissimilar metals between the bolster and the car body structure. You think they would have caught that during design, but apparently they didn't. And uh, so they got some major structural issues with those cars. So those are going to go be replaced first. Mm -hmm. And then the Breda cars will be replaced after those with the same vehicle is the same vehicle which is something that that was suggested years ago uh, by, by a number of transit professionals because the uh, the ridership was kind of at the point where where it made sense you know to do that to have like a universal car basically uh, so they're finally going to do it so that's good but i think that that's uh, very good yeah and you said with the state of the art car the r44 was already around or the state of the art car inspired the r44 what uh, i think the r44 was already around so st louis uh, you know used i guess used that basic car body structure altered it altered it to make it look sexier you know <laughs> with that right. yeah so it wasn't a, a coincidence yeah, but that's my understanding that, that it was based on the R44. Well, the 44 was around first, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I think they. Sorry, go ahead. So I think I think the SOAC had Rockwell trucks, which I'm sure New York City didn't have. But I don't know what the R44 had. But uh, the R44 propulsion was. was General 70 trucks like the uh, 42s. Only difference was the brake rigging. And as I recall, the state of the art car had inside journal trucks. So yeah, I think they had Rockwell trucks, similar to like what uh, truck, yeah, what um, Bart was using, the kind of inboard bearing stuff. Uh, they had the uh, propulsion was Garrett was Garrett propulsion, and Garrett, of course, was supplying propulsion for Bart, other systems back then. So Chopper Chopper was the new wave, you know, technology. <laughs> Everybody wanted Chopper trucks. Okay, so you've been more than gracious taking all our questions, so I think we're going to get uh, just a reminder everyone May 19th is our next show with uh, Ray de Groot. This particular presentation uh, is recorded. It'll be on ERA YouTube within the next week or two. And Rich, I want to thank you again. Any final questions from anybody before we sign off? Uh, I think we covered many topics. So going once, going twice. Rich, this is twice in one week you've done this presentation. <laughs> yeah, I think this was. I think you got the better version. So you got it was excellent. I've never seen such nice. You should look at the compliments, and I agree. It's like a graduate seminar, but far more interesting. So um, I look forward to seeing you at the Midwest Traction Meet in uh, August. So yeah. All right, thank you everybody for for sticking around and for uh, and Rich again. Thank you for a great presentation and see you all May nineteenth. And with that, I wish everyone a good night. Okay, good night. Night all. Good night.